left the staple here last Monday. Okay. I guess I'll have to. <laughs> he says he's ready. I'm afraid of that. Good afternoon. Welcome to the November 4th, 2019 Salina City Commission regular weekly meeting. I'd like to ask of the clerk if the Kansas Open Meeting Act required notice has been provided. Yes. In that case, call the meeting to order and ask for a roll call. Mayor Davis. Here. Commissioner Hay. Here. Commissioner Hodges. Here. Commissioner Hoppick. Here. Commissioner Ryan. Here. If you're able, please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance in a moment of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We will get started with awards and proclamations. Item 3.1, the month of November 2019 is Native American Heritage Month in the city of Salina. Evelyn Nelson, Community Relations Supervisor, will introduce the reader. Good afternoon, everyone. Today we will have a Native American Heritage Month proclamation read by Travis Benoist. Mr. Benoist carries the native name of the first Dawn Eagle. He comes from the Minicanju Band of the Lakota Nation and is from the family of Does Not Eat Dog. Mr. Benoist is a member of the White Mark Society and he is a pipe carrier and a sun dancer. He has a residence, he has been a resident <coughs> of Salina since 1996 and has worked as a football coach for Southeast of Saline, Salina Central, and now Kansas, uh, now with Kansas Westland. In attendance with him today is his wife, the Butterfly Woman, and his two sons, Rowan Bear and Touch the Clouds. For over 400 years, his family has been recorded as living where the Cherry Creek empties into the Cheyenne River in what is now South Dakota. <clears throat> However, long ago, his people had no fences or boundaries. In turn, there is record of his family regularly traveling to what is now Wichita, Kansas, to trade with other nations. Moreover, there is record of the Lakota being involved with the Battle of Indian Rock here in Salina. It is Mr. Benoit's hope and prayer that society recognizes and remembers all nations of people and their rich richness of diversity. With that being said, I would like to introduce Mr. Benoist. Proclamation of the City of Salina, whereas during National Native American Heritage Month, we celebrate and honor indigenous people and their rich tapestry of culture. We recognize an inextricably woven into the past, present, and future of this country. Native American people are descendants of the original indigenous inhabitants of what is now the United States. And whereas our long shared story, there have been too many unfortunate chapters of pain and tragedy discrimination and injustice. All Americans must acknowledge that history while recognizing that the future is still ours, still ours to write. And whereas there are currently 573 federally recognized Indian nations, variously called tribes, nations, bands, pueblos, communities, and native villages in the United States, Approximately 229 of these ethnically, cultural, and linguistically diverse nations are located in Alaska. There are many more nations recognized by their respective states and governments. And whereas Native American people have enriched our heritage and continue to add to all aspects of our society through their generosity of culture and the continued practice of teaching economic, environmental, and cultural <laughs> sustainability. Native American people have moving stories of tragedy, triumph, and perseverance that need to be shared with future generations. And whereas Native American people have helped shape the future of the United States through every turn in our history, today young Native Americans and Alaska Natives embrace open-ended open -ended possibilities 
and are determined their own destinies. And whereas during the month of November, we honor our native peoples in this, their ancestral homes and recognize their continued contributions in strengthening the diversity of our society. This month, let us celebrate the traditions, languages, and stories of Native American people and ensure their rich histories and contributions can thrive with each passing generation. Let us continue to build on the advancements we have made because enduring progress will depend on our dedication to participating in uncomfortable conversations about our nation's history. With sustained effort and unwavering optimism, we can ensure a vibrant and resilient America filled with possibilities and prosperity. Now, therefore, I, Trent Davis, MD, Mayor in the City of Salina, do hereby proclaim the month of November 2019 as Native American Heritage Month. And I encourage the people of Salina to learn more about Native American history and culture and gain the level of meaningful respect for Native American people. In witness, therefore, I have hereunto set my hand and caused the seal of the city of Salina, Kansas to be affixed this fourth day of November 2019. Trent W. Davis, MD, Mayor. Thank, Thank you. you. So very much. Don't go too far, though, because I might have something. I'm, I'm just, when you see one of your kids' football coaches, you just always get excited. But it's nice to see you <laughs> in, in another arena as well. What may happen in Salina this month that may increase awareness of our heritage? There is uh, one more special event coming up. On Sunday, November 10th, the Unitarian Universalist Fellowship will be offering a presentation by activist and author John Stotes. John will be present, will be present about, will present about Native American reparations and his work with the Dakota peoples in Minnesota. This presentation will take place on the Unitarian Fellowship, Universalist Fellowship at 901 East Beatrice in Salina on Sunday, November 10th at 10.30. Thank you. I'm going to have you come get a signed proclamation. Perhaps while he's walking back, maybe during this month, there's some young, energetic, bright young person who can write a paper to answer a question that I had even back in elementary school. I said, well, these folks were here before the Europeans and the Africans who were brought over got here. And it wasn't called American then, so it's kind of improper to call them Native Americans because it wasn't America when, before the other folks got here. And if someone can just find out what this place was called. And I imagine with different tribes, it was probably called several things. But it just seems like we use the term native. It ought to be something other than American because you were native to something before America was, was created. So if there's a high school student or middle school student who can turn a good paper in, I'm sure we'll find some special recognition for you. Just. Bring it to me, I'll take care of it, all right? <laughs> Thank you so very much for, for coming. We'll now move to 3.2. Item 3.2, the day of November 30th, 2019, is Small Business Saturday in the city of Salina. Peggy DeBay, the flower nook, will read the proclamation. The Small Business uh, Saturday Proclamation. Whereas, the government of Salina, Kansas celebrates our local small businesses and the contributions that they make to our local economy and community. According to the United States Small Business Administration, there are 30.7 million small businesses in the United States. They represent 99.7% of all firms with paid employees in the United States, and they are responsible for 64.9% of the new jobs created since 2000 to 2018. And whereas small businesses employ 47.3% of the employees in the private sector of the United States, and whereas 94% of the consumers in the United States value the contributions that small businesses do make in their community. 
And whereas 96% of the consumers who plan to shop with Small Business Saturday said the day inspires them to go to small, independently owned retailers or restaurants that they have not been to before or would have not otherwise tried. And whereas 92% of those companies planning promotions on Small Business Saturday said the day helps their business stand out during the business holiday shopping season. And whereas 59% of the, 50, the small business owners said Small Business Saturday contributes significantly to their holiday sales each year. And whereas Salina, Kansas supports our local businesses that create jobs, boost our local economy, and preserve our community. And whereas advocacy groups as well as public and private organizations across the country have endorsed the Saturday after Thanksgiving as Small Business Saturday. Now, therefore I, Trent W. Davis, MD, Mayor of Salina, Kansas, do hereby proclaim November 30th, 2019 as Small Business Saturday <coughs> and urge residents of our community and the communities across the country to support small businesses and merchants on Small Business Saturday throughout the year. Trent W. Davis, MD Mayor. So what are you going to do to get folks out to spend money? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> yes, indeed. Well, you know, last week, no, no, this week, that was last week, November 1st. Go November 1st. Extra mile day. First Friday. And November first, 1st, first Friday. So we want folks to go that extra mile on November 30th and yeah. get away from the computer. <laughs> Come downtown or wherever your favorite small business is and spend your money here in town. You can actually get great gifts within six blocks of this, of this <coughs> building. Yeah. So support our local businesses. You don't have to share this with a lot of local businesses, but come on up front here. Thank you. And certainly want to thank all of our Businesses probably more of them smaller downtown for putting up with your having your front door and your back door and your alley and your parking spaces torn up for the last two years because it's not been easy. It's going to be great probably in about three more weeks, <laughs> three or four more weeks. Uh, but uh, thank you for hanging in there uh, so that we do have a downtown that's alive to come to. We are now at the Citizens Forum, which is an opportunity for anyone to come to the podium and discuss any item that's not on the agenda. And limit your comments to five minutes, please. Yeah, thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. And I just wanted to take a real quick moment in recognition of Native American Heritage Month. And sometimes when opportunities arise, sometimes you have to grasp that opportunity. But when you asked about certain things that are going on this month and certain things that can be done, I would like to offer one suggestion that has, over the years, kind of bugged me a little bit. And I think this might, you, you have a whole month to do this, and it might be a really good time to do it. But you have two streets in Salina, Arapaho and Navajo, which are misspelled. And I think it would be a really nice gesture to show respect during Native American Heritage Month if we can maybe get those corrected. And there are no businesses on that street. They are all residential and they're really, they're small blocks. So it really ought to be something that could be very easily done and I think it would be a wonderful gesture. Thank you. We have the correct spelling. Uh, <coughs> sorry, I apologize. Uh, the two or streets are Navajo and it is spelled N-A-V-A-J-O. It's spelled with an H at the end. Navajo, H-O. And then the other one is Arapaho. And uh, when we named that street, we added an E on the end of it. And it should be without an E. And they're both over on the west part of town. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I'm guessing the appropriate department head just heard that, so I won't even... I'll make sure of it, yes. I, I, I won't even <laughs> go any further than that. Thank you, Mr. Blanchard. Good afternoon. Hello, I'm Deborah Corrales. And can I bring some more things up to you? Yes, you may. Thank you,
What I handed you is just the, one of the first psychiatric dogs that Helen Keller had as her therapy <coughs> assistant, whatever you want to call it, was an American Pit Bull Terrier. And what I want to share with you is, in 2003, Prince George County, Maryland, authorized a task force to examine the results of their ban, which was put in place in 1996. The task force reported that the ban was ineffective, has a negative impact on the public safety, stretches animal control and sheltering resources very thin. A yearly cost of the ban was $560,000. To enforce their ban. That amount does not include utilities, manpower, overtime caring for the presumed pit bull type dogs because it's based on just looking at them and saying your hair is square, your head is square, your tail is short, and your coat is smooth. You're a pit bull. In a 10 year period, they spent $5,600,000 taking good dogs out of good homes. Which brings me to the question, what does the cost of our ban put on our city finances? And I hope that will be included in the summary that you're going to be presenting. In 2008, the National Canine Research Council reported on a study on the bias of media coverage driven by dog attacks that occurred during a four day period in 2007. Day one, lab mix attacked an elderly man, sending him to the hospital, one article, local paper. Day two, a mixed breed dog attacks and kills a child, local paper wrote two articles. Day three, mixed de breed dog attacked a child, sending him to the hospital, local paper ran one article. Day four, two pit bulls Pit bull type dogs break free from their chains, attack a woman protecting her small dog. She was hospitalized. Her dog was unhurt. <clears throat> it was reported in 230 articles in local, national, and international papers and was also on several cable. No bias there. Just saying. So please really consider the, we look at these dogs, we don't judge their character. We don't judge where they came from. We don't care. They look like a, dog, a pit bull dog. Even if they come from out of state and they're considered in that state a boxer mix, you bring them here and, and no, no bad news to the, to the shelter workers. They're doing what they're told. They say that dog's a pit bull. They don't care if your dog's five years old. For five years has been... Uh, a boxer mix, it is now a pit bull and you're losing it. That's not fair. Thank you. Anyone else wish to address the commission? Hi, my name is Tanya Greer and I'm gonna go ahead and talk a little bit about my dog. He was euthanized uh, 12 days after he was uh, comprehended, contained again. Um, they deemed him an aggressive dog. Uh, that is very not true. Um, he was a dog that was my assistance animal, my emotional support, and my therapy. Um, he had been in the, in the animal shelter for eight months. The city de denied me any, any visitations whatsoever. When I got him back, he was very well behaved, calm. He had his little emotional support jacket on, and he was made for me and my assistance within my home. The courts... Everybody involved, the shelter, were all presented with my medical documentation stated that these dogs played a very big part in my mental health and well-being. And with me being legally blind, I resent the fact that somebody took it upon their own judgment to put my dog down for no reason. I do want justice, and I will eventually hopefully get justice, but just to make it very clear, I lived in a state and a city that did not have a breed specific ban. My dogs were not pit bulls. Capone, 
I have the breeder information as well. And they didn't breed. He, the, the animal just happened to have puppies. He came from a cattle ranch. He was American Bulldog, Boxer Mix. Uh, no, sorry, Boxer, um, oh gosh. Anyway, American Bulldog, Boxer Mix of some sort. I can't think of the third one because I'm a little uptight about it. But all of that work, all the work, never once, and this was prior to me moving to Salina, stated that they were pit bulls, period. Um, Starlet, um, they did a DNA or so forth, but they forgot to close the window, so I know it wasn't actually a real DNA report. Um, they deemed him 100% American Staffordshire. Capone has absolutely no American Staffordshire in him. So, with that being said, um, I, I really feel that uh, when shelters do take a character test on an animal, they better be very specific on the breed and know what they're talking about because apparently they didn't this time. And one more thing I want to talk about is I presented the judge at the municipal court with my paperwork stating that these dogs were my assistance animals. I did not need a service registry for that. I had doctor letters and by federal law, they broke it because they were supposed to return my dogs to me with no questions asked. So with that being said, I, I don't think I want to go any further. There was other things I wanted to talk about. I do want to mention to Mike Schreg, when you're building a, a wheel, a pie, for funds to go out within the general funding, it's not divided into four pieces. A pie is eight, and if it's cheesecake, it's 12. So I think a lot of the resources or funds that y'all have in here, we need to start looking at most important issues first before we start putting out big money on issues that can wait. So anybody wants questions? Well, in your case in particular, since you had court action, we're deliberately not commenting because it's already in a higher authority, so it, it wouldn't be proper for us to comment about okay. your case specifically. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you. Anyone else? Norman Annals, Salina, Kansas. Next Monday, there's no meeting. But for two years, neither the city commission or the county commission has made any mention. What is next Monday? Veterans Day. Why don't you announce it? It's your obligation, it's your duty to report veterans. If it wasn't for the veterans, we wouldn't be here. And to these people, those respect we owe them. If it wasn't for their code talkers, the Navajos, Japan could not break their code. If it hadn't been for them, we owe them a lot, a lot. And to you people, watch. Murphy versus Carpenter in the United States Supreme Court. See what happens. So. You're not going to give us even a little tease? <laughs> <laughs> I look for the court to rule against them. Because this is happening all over the U.S. <clears throat> They're going back. 150, 200, 300 years agreements that were made with these Native Americans. And this for a little bit of teeth, what was it called before the white man invaded this land? Home. It was their home. They'd been here for hundreds and thousands of years. We treated them badly. The largest mass murders in the history of the United States were committed by the white man against the Americans. Sand Creek in 1864. 1868, Spirit Lake up in the Dakotas. So we owe them people. We ought to give them their land back. Because we've done it to other countries, we let Panama have their land back. And there's another one. Look what we did to Hawaii. We deposed 
No, we threw her out. She was a queen. She was the monarch of Hawaii. Wherever the white man has left his footprint, his fingerprints, destruction and disruption has followed. The white man has a disease, a sickness. It's called yellow fever. Words for thought. Is there anyone else to come forward? All right. Thank you for all the comments. We will now move to the consent agenda. And to our guests, you're more than welcome to stay. We, we, we won't be insulted if you leave. <laughs> Unless the kids get extra credit for <laughs> civics class or something. <laughs> Item 6.1, approve the minutes of October 28, 2019, and item 6.2, approve resolution number 19-7756, authorizing the city manager to permit the Salina VFW post 1432 auxiliary volunteers to solicit within the city's rights of way. Is there any item, Commissioner, like removed from the consent agenda? Hearing none, is there a motion to approve? Mayor Davis, I move we approve consent agenda item 6.1 and 6.2. Second. We moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries five to nothing. We go to administration item 7.1. Item 7.1, first reading ordinance number 19-11021, levying Salina Business Improvement District number one service fees for 2020. Ms. Pack. Good afternoon, Mr. Mayor and Commissioners. Kansas state law governs the procedures for uh, cities to uh, create business improvement districts. In 1983, the city of Salina created the downtown business improvement district number one, and they ran the, the, pro the uh, program from 1983 to 1987. Since 1987, that effort has been delegated to Salina Downtown Inc., a not-for-profit advocacy and marketing organization. State law provides that for each BID to have a board of advisors appointed by the city who may also serve as a board for the not-profit corporation. In Salina, the BID and SDI boards are made up of the same individuals serving dual roles. Our city ordinance provides that there shall be 13 members of the Board of Advisors for Salina Business Improvement District Number 1 who shall be appointed by the mayor with the consent of the governing body. The mayor shall make appointments from individ individuals recommended by the Board of Directors of Salina Downtown, Inc. The bid program of services is financed through service fees that are uh, levied on businesses within the district. The annual service fees are mandatory payments as established by city ordinance. Sections 10 and 11 of that ordinance address the enforcement of options for non-payment of the fees because these are not actually levied against the buildings. In the 2020 um, budget process that was presented to commission in the June 24th and July 8th study sessions, the BID board recommended a 1.5% increase in BID fees. And that was what was presented in the, in the budget for 2020 and will be included in the comprehensive fee. There are a couple of action items that you have. You can approve ordinance 19-11021, levying the Salina Business Improvement District number one service fees for 2020. You can approve the ordinance with amendments as you see appropriate. You can postpone consideration of the ordinance to a specific time and date and give staff recommendations for information. You can approve ordinance number 19 on first reading and provide direction regarding additional information or amendments that you would like to request for further consideration at the time of second reading, or you can vote to deny ordinance number 19 -21. Any questions? And I believe Penny was here. I don't know if she's still here. If you have any questions for them. Okay. Questions, concerns? 
No, thank you. Any questions, comments, concerns from the public? Bring it back to the commission for action. Mayor Davis, I move that we approve on first reading ordinance number 19-11021, levying Salina Business Improvement District number one service fees for 2020. Second. Been moved and seconded to approve on first reading ordinance 19-11021. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five to nothing. Thank you. And that will come to second reading on November 18th, I would imagine. Correct. Okay. All right, 7.2. Item 7.2, resolution number 19-7745, authorizing the city manager to sign a service agreement with OCCK Incorporated for 2020. Me again. Yes. Um, OCCK has provided regional transportation services throughout North Central Kansas since 1970. The 2020 budget process included a request from OCCK to fund fixed route public transit system, modified paratransit system, and annual capital improvements. The City of Salina has been partially funding these services at a rate of 30% of their budgeted expenditures since 2009. The other 70% of their, well, a good portion of the rest of their funding, or 70%, comes from the Kansas Department of Transportation. Uh, representatives from OCCK presented to Commission on June 24th study session, and based on City Commission guidance during the July 8th study session, $811,690 in funding was included in the 2020 adopted budget. This level of funding was, was the same that was approved for 2019. During the 2019 budget process, OCCK also requested a 50% a local match for a project that they were doing for their current maintenance facility. And they were unable for that project to get completed until 2020. So at that time, they, they requested that commission carry that money over to 2020 and, it, and advise staff to find a way to do that with them. Since the funding was approved in 2019, staff intends to encumber the funds to OCCK and issue payment to them at the time the project is procured. The attached service agreement has been expanded from recent years agreements to go back to a more formal and inclusive format and to address, to address supplemental agreements for signs in the local match to the KDOT grant mentioned above. The agreement has already been reviewed by staff and by OCCK, and they are here if you have questions for them. The term of the agreement is January 1st through December 31st, 2020. Actions for commission to consider tonight are approved resolution 197745, authorizing the city manager to sign the agreement with OCCK. Approved resolution 197745 with amendments as you <coughs> deem appropriate. Postpone consideration of the resolution to a specific time and date and, re and give us a, a guidance on any additional information you'd like or vote to deny resolution 197745 with us not final being able to sign a formal agreement with OCCK for support for public transit services. Stand for any questions? Does this uh, resolution have anything to do with what we discussed last week about the signage on, I mean, because I think part of it was that was where they, they were getting some of their funding was selling the signage for the uh, the benches. Does that have anything to do with this at all? The agreement includes language that we will address the signage in a supplemental agreement to the this this funding agreement, and that's something we'll work out as that signage agree that signage ordinance goes into place later on. So that will be brought back to us again on that there then, if necessary. Yes. Questions, comments. Um, I, I, I've just got a couple questions. Has the, can, the KDOT grant for the, um, the, the maintenance building, has, I couldn't remember, has that already been approved by KDOT for 2020? Okay, because my question was just to make sure that that $233,000 was somehow linked to that, but if you've already received it, then it obviously becomes not a concern anymore. Um, the I asked the same question okay. because I wanted to kind of get a, an idea. And I think right. they've sent out their RFPs for the project, and they expect those to be coming back any, sometime in the next month or so. Yeah, by the end of the year, I think. Well, that's great. That's, that's really good news. And then um, I received an email right before the meeting today that I did not have time to read very thoroughly, but I just wanted to confirm that OCCK staff had gotten that and could 
um, reply to that citizen's concerns more specifically because I don't know enough about the bus schedule really to 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 ask about that but I understand that people that rely on that schedule really need to rely on that schedule so I just wanted to make sure that those concerns had been you'd receive those as well thanks all right any questions from the public okay right. bring it back to the Commission mr. mayor I'll make a motion we approve resolution number 19-7745 Authorizing the city manager to sign a service agreement with OCCK Inc. for 2020. Second. Moved and seconded to approve resolution 19 7745, authorizing the city manager to sign a service agreement with OCCK for 2020. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 0. Thanks for coming. Uh, 7.3. Item 7.3, approval of the project budget and resource allocation for the Smedley Family Surgical Center continued from the October 14, 2019 meeting. Mr. Cotton, hi Good afternoon. During the October 14, 2019 commission meeting, the approval of step five for the Smedley Family Surgical Center and the support for the budget required to accomplish the project was postponed. This was in order for staff to gather more information for the commission to make a more informed decision on the project. The following day, October 15th, facilities operation manager put together a bid form sheet that was identical for each proposed contractor and specifically identified the requirements for each one of the trades, including new requirements for the sign portion of the project. During the turnaround time on this, the company the staff had proposed to use for the sign changed their business model and is no longer able to help the city. As you can see from the bid documents, there are two prices for the sign and not a third bid. Staff did in fact get a third bid but did not include it because it was not submitted with the proper paperwork. That bid was significantly higher than the low bid and as mentioned was not submitted due to not filling out the proper paperwork. The facilities operation manager discussed the project with each of the contractors who submitted on the project and discussed the needs of the facility drawing with them in detail. Even with that discussion, one bidder submitted the exact same bid they originally submitted, which included eight lights rather than seven lights as specified by the drawing. Each one of the contractors signed off on an acknowledgement that they understood the requirements of the proposed work and is in your packet for review. One final note is that staff used the template to put together the information the city commission requested. Inadvertently, when staff was assembling the documents, an exhibit labeled page number five was added to three of the bids for your review. This page was not <coughs> intended for the contractors, nor was it intended for the city commission. It references items a general contractor would be responsible for, and as the city is acting as its own general contractor on the project, this was not needed and was not edited. The total project budget is estimated to be $45,485.66 with a 5% contingency. Of the total estimated price, $27,296.48 is estimated city expenditures on the project and $16,023.20 are estimated contractor costs. If the contingency is not needed, then is not needed, the total estimated price for this project is $43,319.68. However, staff is requesting the amount with the 5% contingency of $45,485.66 be approved at this time. Low bidders for the project are design chief for the facility signage in the amount of $3,244, Kansas Glass for the storefront in the amount of $4,334.48, City Plumbing in the amount of $2,214.72 for plumbing, and Brule Electric in the amount of $6,250 for the electrical work. This project will be paid for in its entirety from the Animal Services Donation Fund. At this time, staff requests commission approval for the submitted project budget and approval to move forward on the facility renovation into a surgical center. Thank you. Start from the right, any questions? Um, I don't know that it's um, so much of a question, but it is a thank you to staff for going ahead and um, following through with the step. I know that as a, as a member of the governing body, and I would hope that the contractors as well feel a lot better and a lot more confident about the work that's being performed having this kind of, of, of documentation. Before, I thought we were kind of comparing apples and oranges, and some bids quoted a certain number of light fixtures, others did another, and a certain, then the scopes of work varied. So um, I want to thank staff that um, for doing that and to encourage us, even though we can break it down into 16,000 is actually getting 
um, bid out and internally we're completing about 28,000. I, I think just from my perspective that that kind of um, trying to get around our, our spending policy, um, I think it shortchanges the taxpayers, I think it shortchanges us as the governing body, and I think it shortchanges the contractors who are trying to, to bid on these projects. And I think it is notable that we did have two contractors that changed between our first consideration of this item and the second. So thanks to staff, I know it was, um, it was time consuming, but I really appreciate you guys making that extra effort because I, I'm, I'm really pleased by what I see here. So thank you. Thank you. Basically the same thing. I appreciate the bid proposal form. I feel comfortable that, that all contractors have actually had the same data and we're, we're making bids on the same information. So again, thanks for that. And I think any time we have any type of bid like this, that something like that's advantageous for the governing body to have. So, sure. Gentlemen? I don't have the other one that we had before sitting in front of me. Were there any differences or any changes in the bidders since we brought it back and had it um, had redone? I would tell you that, well, the, the I've got it right here. The, the, signage, the signage prices um, are a little bit different because, again, the original company uh, dropped out. Um, the rest of them are similar. I know that one company, I believe, Street Plumbing increased their price by a little bit, where City Plumbing dropped theirs, and Brule Electric added a little bit to theirs, but still the overall price, I do believe, was actually less than the last time by a few dollars. Okay, thank you. All right, thank you. Any questions, comments from the public? Bring if it back I, to if the I commission. can clarify one I'm sorry. thing, I, I, not to discount anything that Commissioner Hodges said about the intent, and I think we're all on the same page there. But, um, but <laughs> the one of the things we're working on is the purchasing policy to, to more clearly articulate what the requirement is in a project like this. I, I'm not prepared to say that the approach that was taken was not in keeping with the purchasing policy. Our purchasing policy could be more clear in that regard. and. That is a, a project staff's working on to bring back to you to get some additional guidance. And, and it's a much more, uh, a much broader revision of the purchasing policy than just that, but that particular topic will be one of the items for discussion. Thank you. And I guess just one other thing to add, <coughs> I hope we don't have to go through this ever again because one thing that you just brought up that I just seen and, you know, prices was out there for the pe for the public to see and we went back and we rebid it again and we had one of the places discount there mm -hmm. we had one place up their up their bid uh, you know that's like I said I hope we never have to go through anything like that again to where <coughs> we have to go back and have you know maybe somebody lose a bid because now they've already seen the other bids and they decide to make theirs lower yes sir all right. Thank you. Thank you. Any action to be taken? Um, Mayor Davis, I move that we approve the project budget for the Smedley Family Surgical Center, um, authorizing the project budget of $43,319.68 with a 5% contingency for a total of $45,485.66 with a contracted portion of the project being awarded to design chief for the signage in the amount of $32.24, Kansas Glass for the storefront in the amount of $43.34.48, City Plumbing for plumbing in the amount of $22.14.72, and Brule Electric for the electrical work in the amount of $62.50. Second. Right. It's been moved and seconded to approve the project budget and resource allocation for the Smedley Family Surgical Center. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five nothing. Seven point four. Item seven point four, resolution number one nine dash seven seven six two, providing for the advisability and authorization of a special assessment district for street, sidewalk, and drainage improvements for Markley Road from the north right of way line of Magnolia Road to a point north approximately three thousand eight hundred and fifty eight feet as a direct access perimeter street. 
believe this will, there we go. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. <coughs> we do have a minor edit to this one, so I'm gonna hand out some new blue sheets. is a long time in the making. Um, as you may remember, we've had quite a few study sessions on this <coughs> over the last few years, starting really with um, some developers wanting to plat this area. And the area that we we're talking about is around Markley Road, east of, east of Salina. A large uh, sanitary sewer um, interceptor was put in years ago for kind of the expansion of um, this area would eventually grow that way, and our comprehensive plan has our some of our retail, or not retail, our residential growing in that direction. So, a few, a couple of developers have approached the city on platting some area out in out in the uh, along Markley Road, and with them, uh, lots of questions were raised regarding that about what to do with Markley Road, and then eventually Holmes Road as well, but through many um, study sessions and um, commission actions over the last few years, it's culminated into this final document that we're excited to present to you today. It is a um, basically a resolution that assesses um, the benefit area in this, that um, last time we were here, it was September 9th, it was the last time we, we talked about it, this whole area would be 25% assessed to this large benefit area. and. 75% would be uh, taken on by the city. So that's what these documents today talk about. There's many documents that um, <laughs> that have to be produced to actually make this happen. So one thing that did come up, um, that why I handed out the amended blue sheets was um, one of the properties is platted. Magnolia Hills uh, number two is platted. We did get that platted before pending the action today on Markley Road, but it is platted, whereas Wheatland Valley is kind of waiting and is contingent on this action today for Markley Road. So we added some language in there just in case um, Wheatland Valley something falls through or there's something that happens where he um, would not be on the hook for um, immediate um, assessments, whereas a person who plats this area and connects to the road, which in this case is Magnolia Hills 2, uh, they are going to be subject to assessments when this property or this uh, road is actually improved. So that's still, you know, quite a ways away. It's 4,500 cars approximately, and 6,500 is think we're thinking is kind of the threshold limit for maybe a an a, a improvement. And just to be, you know, comparison's sake, that's Iron Avenue barely has 6,500 cars. Marymount does not. So just looking at some areas that are close to this that don't necessarily have that, that, that many vehicles yet. So it's quite a ways out, but either way, this sets up the city for collecting some of the cost of the improvements to the properties that actually benefit from. So this area does benefit some from, these, uh, from the improvement to Markley Road. And so they would be um, in the benefit district for the Markley Road improvements. So that's what this, that's what this entire resolution is, is for. There's a feasibility study that talks about the costs. It's pretty simple, but it's it's a, uh, you know, generally so many dollars a, a foot for road improvements and sidewalk improvements and grading and storm sewer. It's all, it's just <coughs> kind of a normal um, uh, kind of a s estimate that's, you know, not real detailed yet, but it uh, covers us in the, in the event that we put in a street here. And the resolution the, and the petition uh, signed by the two property owners, which is Wheatland Valley and Magnolia Hills, Inc. And then as the area develops, if it does develop, then other people would be subject to assessments as well if they platted their property and connected to Markley Road. So if they don't, 
then it never really actually becomes an issue for them. But if they decide to plot or improve their property someday, then they would be subject to the same percentage, 25% cost of the, of the total road. So. Um, I guess the language we added just talked about uh, really just amended a, a, a basically furthermore construction of the improvement shall not commence until a final plat is approved for Wheatland Development Company incorporated property. So we have no reason to believe that's not going to happen quite a bit sooner than any improvements to Markley that would ever occur, but it, that language helped to cover a Wheatland Development Company just in case he doesn't plat immediately or something changes about his plat eventually. but. That was what's that's what's changed. So I will uh, stand for questions on this one. And if I may, and, and to add a little context to that, um, I'm assuming you all recall that we did the perimeter road ordinance as in, uh, with the intention of trying to anticipate impacts on not just the interior streets that are typically specially fi assessment finance, but provide for financing of the the perimeter road. So that. That ordinance change was made, and this is the first time we've actually implemented that, which kind of contributes to the difficulty and the level of detail that we've struggled with. So uh, to, to be more frank, I guess, about the need for the amendment that, that was distributed to you is we've kind of created a catch-22. As part of that perimeter ordinance, we've said we won't approve a plat unless uh, provision is made for financing of the perimeter road. Well, in fairness to the developer, they can sign the petition and not know that we'll approve the plat. And, it, and we have put them potentially in a catch-22 if we don't at least provide that we won't start the assessment district unless they submit a plat and we approve it. It's kind of a uh, who's going to go first in terms of taking action. If we, if we left that unaddressed, the worst case scenario could be that we could disapprove or, or choose not to approve any platting on the ground but still improve Markley Road and assess them uh, and the, the cost of improving Markley while we're withholding approval of their plat. So we've tried to synchronize the two actions. Um, we also ha added some language that the traffic count is the threshold for which the w would be the starting point of a uh, forming an assessment district, but we reserve the discretion on the part of the city to, uh, or in, at a time period that deemed in the best interest of the city. So if we find ourselves on this one or any of the other uh, assessment districts you're going to be considering today, having met the traffic threshold, we still have the ability to uh, make a timing decision beyond the point that that threshold's made. If we get to that point in time and we see that the, the, the road's performing okay or because of financing it makes sense to, and because of our finances it makes sense to delay that, that project a year or two, something like that. So all of these projects are intended to try to anticipate, put ourselves in a position proactively um, when, we, when the opportunity presents itself to have a benefit district in place but the timing of them is such that they're going to have to be responsive to the thresholds that are that are in the agreement. So the other thing that, that Dan mentioned, and I, I assume that you're aware of it, but just to be clear, that 75-25 percentage split, that 25 percent then gets distributed among the benefit the properties that benefit. So to say that each property is subject to 25 percent, not each of them at that 25 percent value, but they are proportionally sharing. Uh, the, the cost that was allocated to the benefit district amongst themselves and that total contribution um, totals that 25 percent as you previously directed us to proceed. So with that I'd be happy to answer any questions between Dan, myself, and we do have Gina Rekoff from Gilmore and Bell here as our bond council as well who's been in, <laughs> instrumentally involved in, in drafting all of this. Since there's other numerous tracks involved, a quick question. if. If one of those decides to be platted prior to Markley Road being improved, then we would handle that like we are the current yep, Magnolia Hills. Today, right? If Magnolia or if Markley is improved and then there's they somebody wishes to plat and become part of the district, do they have to pay a lump sum then? How does that work? If, yes, if it happens after Markley Road's already been improved. And I'll quickly defer to Ms. Rikoff to, to correct me when I'm wrong, but uh, we have two petitioners today that are forming the district, and so that's what's initiating this. We've identified the, the benefiting area beyond just the area owned by the petitioners, and the remainder of that is set up as 126A19. So if nothing changes, um, the improvements will be installed per the, the special assessment district. The city would essentially carry the, the cost of the 126A19 portion until they benefited and had to pay. 
if prior to us uh, commencing the improvement project, any of those property owners wish they could petition to become part of the district, which would afford them annual payments over 15 years versus a lump sum payment that would be due if they didn't choose to uh, petition and become part of the district and the improvements were constructed. If they're constructed, at that point then when they benefit by planning and connection, they, they would have to make a lump sum payment for their share. And we have no trouble because if I'm correct, some of these properties are actually not in the city limits, or they're in the county, is that correct? A little bit of both, yes. But we have no trouble taxing them the way we're discussing right, it. By way of the 12-6A-19, it contemplates okay. uh, that scenario. So um, we staff had has, a, has had a conversation about uh, the county comprehensive plan and inter interlocal agreement and our authority to review and comment on improvements at the edge of the city outside the city limit. So we'll have, there's an opportunity there to have input and basically direct uh, those improvements back to our system. Currently, there's a sanitary sewer project going on in this area as well. So it's, you know, it's a long, maybe a long time it'll be developed, but there will be things are moving in that direction, I guess. As to the city's <laughs> debt limit, uh, there are some exclusions there for sanitary sewer and uh, that don't count against the, uh, the debt limit. Do we segregate those things as a uh, keep track of them, or do they? Would we have to separate them? We to, currently to do not. Not only do we not segregate by that type of project, we don't segregate special assessment financing. So it's a little difficult to break it out to that level of detail. Uh, Debbie Pack and the finance department has uh, been working on singling out or identifying the uh, special assessment financing. But to take it to that next level, we'd have to go back into each project and, and identify the eligible costs, which I the the costs that are exempt from the debt limit, which I understand to be water, sewer, and storm, but not street. So if it ever became necessary, uh, we, could, we could look at that as a possibility, um, but uh, the debt limit is just that. It's a, it's a cap on debt issuance, and the numbers that were provided as part of the uh, staff report assumed all these projects went on the books immediately when, from a timing perspective, um, they're all, they all have conditions that have to be met, and we really don't know the time frame. It'll be a function of the pace of development. But as I said earlier, trying to be proactive, this, this is our opportunity to, to get ahead of it. If we approve those plats without having these provisions in place, uh, we've kind of lost our opportunity to, to get the financing structured. So um, it could, it, depending on which road segment you're talking about, which uh, traffic count you're talking about, it could be a number of years um, in the future. Thank you, Mr. Stack. Oh, thank you. Any uh, comments, questions, concerns from the public? Hearing none, bring it back to the commission for action. Mayor Davis, I move we approve resolution number 19-7762, authorizing a special assessment district for street, sidewalk, and drainage improvements for Markley Road for the north right-of-way line of, from the north right-of-way line of Magnolia Road to a point north approximately 3,858 feet as a direct access perimeter street as amended. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 19-7762. Any further comments? Uh, Mayor Davis, if I could, just a moment. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to explain why I, I, was, I am going to be voting um, against this action because I still believe that the 7525 split if you if you look at the cost breakdown and and what the city at large is expecting to be to absorb it just it it, it just i uh, that's just it doesn't strike me as being fair especially when we come out of a study session where we're talking about our fire department and emergency medical services crew being stretched um, to the breaking point and having to invest in all kinds of overtime to provide coverage and we're talking about spreading those resources more um, I just this is this is one time where I think that the that the people that want to develop in that area just deserve to carry a little bit more of that burden because that's not the only burden that it places on the taxpayers so thank you very much any additional comments all in favor say aye aye, aye. Any opposed? Nay. 
Motion carries four to one. And we go 7.5. Item 7.5, resolution number 19-7760, providing for the advisability and authorization of a special assessment district for water, sanitary sewer street and drainage improvements for Magnolia Hills Estates edition number two, and authorization of the mayor to execute an improvement district development agreement between the city of Salina and Magnolia Hills Estates Incorporated. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. This one is related to the specific um, internal improvements for Magnolia Hills Estates uh, number two. It's a property just east of the current Magnolia Hills Estates edition and kind of just gets to about the halfway point between Holmes and, and Markley, 19.4 acres. And there's the ultimate number of lots here, um, 29 building lots total for phases one, and then another, um, there's so many lots for phase two. So the internal improvements here are uh, water, sewer, street, and then some additional improvements beyond their um, area that they're plat uh, that have, that they've platted has to go beyond that area. They have to tie into a sewer further to the east and put in the, the trunk line for that, as well as build a detention bond, detention pond further to the east, almost to Holmes Road, kind of to serve the whole d subdivision. So some of those um, costs for those, uh, for those portions will have to be assessed over the whole area. So it's a little bit more of a complex um, uh, benefit district, I guess you'd say, and it's basically the last page of your uh, packet talks about, or last page of the, of, the, of, the, of the engineering report and petition talks about the different costs and attributable costs to each property. And there's, it's just, it's a quite a, quite a few lots in this that will eventually be um, assessed for different portions. But the, um, the uh, Improvement District Development Agreement, the petition, the resolution of advisability, and the feasibility report are, are for the first phase today. And have been the petition was signed by uh, Kelly Dunn. And it's, uh, Magnolia Hills Incorporated has developed, like I said, the property to the west of here and continuing to the east. I'm trying to think of anything else. They are asking for an ag deferral. So that is something to consider as well. These documents have been drafted for ag deferral. They're, they've platted a portion. Uh, like I said, that's that goes the benefits from Markley, but as they go further to the east, gets closer to Holmes, and um, those uh, pro those those uh, improvements are in unplatted property and um, have the option to be ag deferred, and so that's what they're asking for. We've drafted it that way, but that is something that we want to bring to your attention, in case that's something we want to edit or uh, modify. I guess I will stand for questions on this one as well. Again, if I could jump in with a couple of things. Um, the ag deferral that Mr. Sachs referring to is for the improvements that are necessary to serve the phase that's being developed. It's not complete build out of the property um, eastward towards homes. It's extension of sewer and storm detention. So it's necessary to serve this phase, um, but it's not full build out of uh, the entire portion that would be ag assessed or ag deferred. Um, and then previously you asked staff to look into the question of property tax assessment uh, as it relates to vacant properties and we felt like this was probably the special assessment question that it applied to the most or it was most applicable. So uh, we provided you a memo from, from me addressing that question and so we've got a lot of references to assessment going on. We really have three kinds of assessments. I, first I thought it would be helpful to clarify. The action that you're being asked to take is um, special assessment, so a special assessment financing. We referred to ag deferral of some of those assessments. And then the property taxation question is ag assessment of vacant property. That, that's the question that was raised before. And um, uh, as I understood it, staff was asked to research whether it would be possible to uh, add something to the development agreement that would 
and for lack of a better word, waive the ag assessment or have the property developer, property owner agree to pay as if they were taxed at, at an assessment other than, than ag. And so that required some research to get an understanding of what contributed to the ag assessment by the appraiser in the first place. And so um, what I've learned is vacant lots are uh, essentially either categorized as ag or vacant. And, you know, you can think about residential, industrial, commercial, but it's essentially ag or vacant, and ag is, at, is taxed at a, assessed and taxed at a lower rate. So to try to gather some information to be able to address the question, uh, we looked at state statute, consulted city legal counsel, city bond counsel as it relates to the drafting of the development agreement. I spoke multiple times with uh, Saline County Appraiser Sean Robertson. I spoke with legal counsel for the Kansas Department of Revenue Property Valuation Division. Uh, they referred me to court cases and, and Board of Tax Appeals cases and uh, some 2016 session laws as well. And so in, in somewhat brief summary, there is a Board of Tax Appeals a case that the ruling of that case is, it may not seem like common sense necessarily, but it does opine that there's no statutory prohibition against a landowner planting grass in order to obtain a more favorable classification, meaning agriculture. And that, that dated back to the 1990s. And uh, so uh, you combine that with the statutory definition of what is dedicated use for an agricultural purpose and it, it appears that it's pretty broad, pretty liberal in the interpretation of that statute. What legal counsel for the Department of Revenue pointed out was more recently there was a, a court case out of Johnson County, I believe, that where they denied a request for ag assessment on the basis that it was a mixed use of uh, nine acres, I believe, for hay and, and a residence on one acreage. and so. Um, they were uh, Johnson County was successful in denying that request for ag assessment, but the thing that the Department of Revenue Legal Counsel pointed out is then subsequently the legislature went back and amended the statute, amended the definition of, of dedicated use for an agricultural purpose to make make the statute more broad and essentially uh, kind of reverse or, or make future requests for mixed application of different uses and and uh, the ag assessment um, easier to obtain. And so her point was, and, and she indicated she actually taught classes on this, her point was that the legislative intent seem, appears to continue to be a very liberal interpretation of, of that ag assessment. And so, and we also had conversations with bond counsel. Um, I shared in, in my memo that uh, first impression and it seemed like it may be analogous to some tax increment financing approaches that, that caused IRS concerns about whether the bonds were tax exempt or taxable. But ultimately, um, given the fact pattern that we're talking about here, that didn't turn out to be a concern for bond counsel. And so we identified two possible scenarios that we might be able to try to approach a, a development agreement and, and provisions uh, that we might be able to put into a development agreement. One, uh, one of them that we um, identified was that the property enter owner enter into an agreement with the city to have their property assessed with um, basically a vacant or residential assessment rather than ag and not prote protest a residential assessment. Um, but that had practical difficulties in that that still left the county appraiser having to apply the statute and apply the BOTA cases and it didn't seem likely that they would deviate from that initial ag assessment which then started into um, kind of the reverse of what you typically see would would that property owner appeal their their determination to their own detriment and did we have any recourse as a city by way of the agreement and ultimately in talking with the, the county appraiser, they didn't feel like they, just based on the terms of the development agreement, could alter their um, appraisal or their assessment and legal counsel. Uh, didn't feel like we could, could resolve all the practical difficulties favorably. The other, one, other uh, uh, scenario that we looked at was if the property owner entered into an agreement with the city to use and maintain the property in such a way that it just didn't qualify as ag, that it, uh, it 
taking into account the provisions of the statutory definition, they agreed not to use the property that way. But when you look at the statutory definition, it, it is very broad and talks about beekeeping and poultry, uh, uh, poultry, I believe, and fruit trees. And so again, we found ourselves thinking, you know, it, it, what, it's not as easy as saying you promise not to hay it or you promise to mow it. Um, it still left uh, considerable discretion on, on the part of the appraiser and the developer. Um, ultimately, we, we didn't feel like we could find a very, a very practical way as a starting point, and then we really struggled with remedies. I mean, you could try to do something in the way of um, injunctive relief, but that assumes we can see the violation coming and have enough time to file in court and, and get a court ruling when the assessment is, is a point in time and it'd be hard to anticipate that and financial remedies um, might uh, you might be able to get financial remedies for any abatement that we needed to do or any legal expenses but we really struggled to come up with a model where the financial remedy was to pay taxes that weren't due and create some uh, collection and, and distribution method so as I as I concluded in my memo um, I think the, this starts with the statutory language. Um, you know, ev everything I've seen from the Department of Revenue and otherwise is the approach that's being used in Salina isn't inappropriate. It is appropriate. I, I guess that'd be the better way to put it, and it's not unique to Saline County. Um, there are examples of properties adjoining a golf course where it just depends, property by property, how it's being used by the property owner, whether. And nearly identical properties receive different assessments by the county assessor outside of Saline County, uh, and then large commercial properties in high traffic areas that that avail themselves of the ag assessment as well. So, um, the the more straightforward way to uh, resolve this is probably a, a statutory amendment um, that clarifies it once and for all. And we don't find ourselves trying to run up against Board of Tax Appeals decisions and other court decisions and. Uh, re revised legislation in response to those court decisions and, and it leaves the appraiser in a defensible position to just administer the statutes as they're written. So um, uh, we certainly tried to get to the bottom of it. We tried to brainstorm an alternative, uh, what I would say are creative scenarios to try to get there. Um, it just there, there's a lot of practical difficulties and there's a lot of history outside of Saline County headed in the other direction. So um, we added that as part of this because we, the question related to the development agreement and what we could or couldn't do in that regard, so I felt it appropriate to report that out at this point. Any questions? Any more questions? Well, I guess I'm a <coughs> classical underthinker here because I read this and I thought, I think we can, I think we can work with this. I really do. Um, and I mean, I some of the some of the questions. I mean, granted, and I think you know, I think your approach is is to give it all the detail you can and to come up with you know every um, you know situation that might arise, and that that that's great. Um, but I'm, I am thinking that you know some of these things. I'm sure don't most subdivisions have like. Um, covenant codes and restrictions in terms of like what you can do and not do like in that property like I'm assuming that you know if, you, if you've got a, a new development that's going to be having $350,000 houses on it and somebody buys a lot and decides that they want to um, you know plant it in corn or start a beekeeping enterprise um, you know I I, I kind of wonder where that enters into the conversation, conversation too, in terms of what kinds of subdivision regulations, um, it, you know, what kind of covenants exist for people buying in those um, um, subdivisions. And I, I, I think that the, the other reason I'm, I'm, I'm pushing to see if there's any way that we can do this is I mean, it's not only tax revenue for the city; it's tax revenue for the county. It's 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 for the schools. It's for it's it's for everything. So, I guess if it seems like it's going to be too great of a challenge for us to to take up, is this something that the governing body is willing to um, to promote as we develop our um, 
our, our list of things that we're concerned about um, for the upcoming legislative session. And I think that's probably also another conversation that, that, that we need to have because if this kind of relief can only happen at the state level, then I think it's incumbent upon us um, to, to list that as, as, as one of our concerns. It's not just losing out on, you know, internet sales tax. We're losing out on property tax revenues, um, you know, if, if we don't see a way around this loophole. So, I mean, I guess that's why I'm turning to my other governing body members and asking, is that something that, that you would be interested in or you would be willing um, to speak in favor of at the state level if that's the way that it needs to be addressed? And the timing so, is good. Yeah, the the yeah, chamber reached out and they're preparing their legislative priorities as we speak. So. And with all due respect to the chamber, I would like to see us develop our own priorities list because I would say probably 80% of the time they do overlap, but there are some things that are more mm -hmm. important to us that maybe don't represent the business interests of, of, of the businesses that they represent. So um, I think it would, be, it would be lovely to schedule some um, conversation time in terms of of our legislative priorities as well. I would just suggest that we get our thoughts crystallized and if there's a, enough of a right. common and voice. Yeah, the, yeah, and if there's not a consensus here, then it's a non-starter. But that's why I'm looking, you know, I'm looking to the rest of you because if four of us are not interested in it, then it doesn't go any further. So when, when do we put our legislative agenda? I mean, because I know that that's happened before, mm -hmm. that, you know, we've had a, a session where we discussed right. those. I, I actually was trying to go through my email to see it. it the chamber is working on it as we speak, and I think they're going to start having conversations in the next couple of weeks. So um, I've not identified a study session uh, date, but we could do that if, if you like. I think that's, I, I, again, speaking for myself, I think that's a, that'd be a great idea. I mean, I'd, I'd kind of like to, you know, uh, in, in, a, in terms of a Venn, Venn diagram, I mean, we've got the city, we've got the Chamber of Commerce, and I, like I said, I'm sure that there's a lot of overlap there, but, you know, if they're hearing from two different bodies that, you know, these issues are important, I, I, I think that's a, a good statement to make. That it doesn't, it's not just important to the city or it's not just important to um, the chamber, but it's two separate entities that both see something or the, or, you know, a set of, of issues as um, things that affect our community. Of course, our, our interests will be at odds with some aspects of the business community's interest right. in that because it's an investment. So yeah, that's the one we might have to be willing to <coughs> go alone on. Yeah, we do need to have a because I just comes to mind. There's probably one or two things that I think w that I have on my mind that we might want to send to the to the you know to the state as far as a priority from us. So I think we need to do that. We need to find out because do they they uh, convene again in January? Yeah, and I, I know the chamber's working on it proactively, but it, the legislature takes up again next year. So if we could find a time period to do that. I guess on this, Mr. Stack, we had how many lots in phase one and how many in phase two? Yes, I did find the map in your in your document there. If you go to page 51, yeah, I have it. that's probably the best way to see it. And there looks like there's 59 total, so you're close to the back, seven, to seven or eight from the back. Is this the page you're talking about? That's the one. Yeah. Yes, sir. I just didn't know if you had it off the top of your head without trying to. Or well, I just thought I'd show you <laughs> phase one there. Um, my understanding, Wayne, how many lots are in that thing? Actually, I think I've got it here. I think I put it in this document. 29? Does that make sense? Yeah, 29 I, I have. So, okay, okay I'm going to go with that. 29 in the first phase. Then phase two. Six. 
17 ish. 18. So 18, okay, maybe. 17. Okay. 18. Yep. Right. So, okay. 16. Somewhere around there. Yeah, I think it's 40. Yeah, it's 45 total, so it has to be 16. 29 and 16. If you go to that page as well, you can kind of see that east, that future development area. You can see the the dashed line there where the sanitary sewer is going, um, the storm sewer detention basin in the northeast corner. And if you go to the next page, then it shows it kind of colored. Try to make a colored map for talking about the different assessments for um, the kind of the future. I guess it's infrastructure that has to be put in now that will be assessed over the uh, over a larger area with um, those to be deferred. Is that right, Mike? That's how those those actually are deferred mm -hmm. for a while, if that is your choosing. I can tell you that Magnolia Hills is doesn't have a lot. Don't have, doesn't have, does not have a vacant lot or a lot for sale. They are they are sold out. So this is the next phase that they are excited to pursue. Dan, I think this is the project to discuss the affirmation of property taxes and how that all played out. Mm -hmm. so feel oh, free. Yes, to <laughs> good timing, Mike. Yes, um, we do have to check on the. Uh, Prop, the property owners, in this case, are Magnolia Hills, Inc. There's three of them. There's Kelly Dunn, Stan Byquist, and James Markle. And we always have to check for delinquent specials. So last time, um, when we first talked about this in June, there were no delinquent specials on them. When we talked about it two weeks ago for, um, what were we talking about then? I'm trying to remember. That was <laughs> Stone Lake. OK, it was a Stone Lake developer, actually. And one of them is in this development as well. He did have some delinquent specials. So Kelly Dunn did have some delinquent specials two weeks ago. He no longer has those delinquent specials, but he had them as of the Monday when we talked about Stone Lake. But we don't. Uh, he does not have them as of the next Wednesday, the day two days after he paid them. And so as of today, there are no delinquent specials on anyone in this in this development. So just to be uh, just to confirm that. And so you may have seen on the agenda planner for I believe the 18th. Right. Um, bringing back amendments to agreements related to Stone Lake. Um, part of that conversation, part of the conversation we had with the developers, our current policy anticipates that the city is going to do the, the construction, oversee the construction contract. So it requires performance bonds and payment bonds, financial securities uh, at the outset, when the actual performance bond would be between the developer and the contractor, and maintenance bond would probably start with the developer and need to be transferred to the city when we accept the improvements. And then the financial security would be necessary at the point that uh, they turn in all their bills and they're seeking reimbursement. So the item that's on uh, the upcoming agenda is to better speak to the the scenario that they're proposing, where as developer they, they oversee the construction contract. Our intention is to acknowledge the transition of the status of um, the delinquent uh, property taxes as part of that resolution amendment so that we're on record kind of walking through that whole history. And, and that was a question that was raised uh, when Stone Lake came up and in response to the question staff researched it and found it, that there were delinquent uh, property taxes at the time. Two properties. And just, just to confirm, since you were talking about um, the number of lots, um, based on the information that um, uh, Ms. Driscoll graciously <laughs> provided at the very last minute today, um, am I correct in, a, in assuming then that that would take our number of lots created in 2019, that would be added to the, the 78 that we have on file? I know we were kind of uh, discussing that earlier, so would that mean that we then have the, does that make sense? Or? So we had said 78 lots pending yeah. for 2019, and that's based on Wheatland Valley's entire phase one through three. Okay. So that's the total there. Okay. He's planning to phase one, yes. 24 of those. So right. 24 of those would have special assessments, because um, typically, you're requesting specials for just a phase at a time in which you're right. building. So they're right. That would equal the 24 buildable lots. Not all 78 would be buildable okay. upon completion. Okay. Yeah, I, th okay. I think there's a difference created on paper in terms of platting and then 
ultimately special assessment or financed in some way, okay. infrastructure constructed and actually being available on the market. Okay, so, so I need to figure out a better way to ask my question. I got well, it. <laughs> well, no, no, no. <laughs> there's I, a, I mean, a there's a difference in vocabulary that, 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 you know, if I don't have the right vocabulary, then I'm not able, I, I can't ask it to get the information I need. And, and you know, what's in... Yeah, I'm not. I'm, I'm not by any means calling anybody out or anything. It's just I'm. I'm trying to figure out how to um, uh, get the information. Yeah, I'm wondering like. if we don't need to agree on some standardized tabular report that we right. could produce. Right. Well, I've been kind of pulling stuff together as we've been talking from earlier today, and I think maybe the, one of the easiest ways to think about it is you have kind of like three three steps, steps within the right. development process in the right. city of Salina. You have platted lots. Right. You have lots that have then received special assessment financing or approval for that. Right. And then you have buildable lots. Right. And so at any one time, just because they're on paper, doesn't mean they've been special assessments or the infrastructure's been built. Right. The next phase is we've given them permission to finance, put in that infrastructure. And then the question is, when does the infrastructure get put in? And once that's in, plat's done, those are ready to be built on. So, and, and so the better way to get that would be like to, to just have like the three columns with those three numbers because that would be a lot, that would be a lot more accurate than the ones that have just been platted, the ones that have had specials, and the ones that are actually buildable, right? Yeah, I think there's one. I, I think there's one more piece of information, and that's whether they've sold and whether they're currently on the market. And so, um, right, staff right. doesn't have direct access to some of the, the realtor information, but I think we've got uh, people that can help us pull that data too. Cool. So I just built that table a couple items ago, so I just need to check numbers <laughs> with Dean. So we should be able to get that Thank for you. you. How many lots did we do in the in the Stone Lake phase two and three? Thanks. Seventeen for uh, Bradley for phase two. And phase three A, B, and C totals 107. Right, but just the ones we approved specials for. Phase three A is just 30 ish. How many is how many is phase three A? 42. 42. 42. And then the phase one in this would be 29. So in Magnolia Hills first phase is is completely sold out and I believe is it River Trail 2? There's Dean, do you have a number of how many's left there? The last number I had was from the summer and it was 15 left. 15. Yeah. They're all under 10. They're under 10 now. Could, could you repeat his answer? He's, okay. Dean said that there's in the summer we had checked and there was about 15 left. But as I talked when I talked to Craig the last time they're under 10 now in River Trail. Any more questions? Any questions, comments from the public? John Blanchard, 250 South 9th Street. Uh, this is the third week in a row, I believe, that we've come back, and I appreciate that, that a seven-page memo was prepared. I most certainly appreciate Bond Council with the clarification about the that there was no reason why we couldn't have a development agreement put together to address the vacant loss versus ag valuation uh, just real quick because your seven page memo read like a legal brief and I just was curious if if our actual legal counsel concurs a hundred percent with the findings of that of that report as it pertains to the problems that <coughs> you would have in, well, there were two scenarios put forward. And then both of them were kind of, we were told as to why they both won't work. I tend to uh, agree with scenario one being problematic. I don't see a problem with scenario two being so overly pro problematic. I think that uh, the mutters, the waters were muddied considerably in this, and if you'd allow me, I just have a few questions that may trigger a response from you and maybe bond counsel, but I doubt it. 
because you seem to have when your scenario. Let me suggest. Sure. What would you suggest as the ascertainable standard by which the objective could be achieved? Uh, something that's along that's the lines. Down to the yeah, something level. along the lines of your scenario two, but I think that in your scenario two, you say things like you want to reserve the city's right to abate any of the prohibited areas. I think there are there are levels of enforcement that maybe we haven't fully considered. And also, um, as far as the injunctive relief being that we have to somehow anticipate the action of the county appraiser, there is a judgment made on the appraiser in time for a, for a uh, protest by the property owner before the tax is levied officially. So there's generally that period ahead of time where the property owner is notified of what the assessment is and is allowed to then to, to discuss that. So on that, on that level, I'm not sure that we fully have to uh, fully anticipate what that might be. And I think that maybe some other ways that we frame this might be different. And, and so let me just kind of put it out this way as a simple alternative. And that is, is that we are entering into a development agreement to extend special assessment financing, which is, if we just look at it on its face, we are extending financing and asking for something in return, which is a condition in, in scenario number two to say you will um, be prohibited, you, are wa you will waive your rights to use your property in any way, and I like the part about putting the statute word for word in there to clearly demonstrate what is meant by that. Um, and the penalty, the, so the enforcement would be you are, deed, you are in essence deed restricted or by covenant not able to perform agricultural uses. That is not uncommon in your typical code covenant and restrictions. <coughs> Any neighborhood, and I don't know if this homeowners association has covenants, but typically that's something that would not only take care of the need for the city to go in and abate the property because they can self-police, but also the fact that um, there are other deed restrictions that may prohibit agricultural uses anyway. I doubt that if I buy a $300,000 house in a, in a protected neighborhood, that there isn't something in there that says my neighbors aren't going to raise chickens and they're not going to create a lot of dust by cutting hay in the residential lot next door. So I think there are a lot of um, things that are in here that, that kind of muddy the water. And just my last point, and it's, and it's the part about the penalty, I don't think you have to worry about some sort of unright taxation or any penalties or fees because I don't think you'd have to do that. I think the penalty could be that at whatever point in time that person breaches the contract, that their balance of their special assessment financing would become due in full. And so it's not adding anything additional, it's just saying if we're going to advance you the financing, if you breach the contract, then you must pay back that financing, a foreclosure, or what, some sort of action like that where it's, you're, we're, we're asking for the financing back, so now you have to pay that all. I don't know if that is kosher with bond council because, but it seems to me that if the other parts were not, that part wouldn't be because it's still <laughs> the financing of public infrastructure. So those are the parts, I think, I think there's, there are more clear and, easy ways to get this, and I appreciate your hearing me out. I just have a question for the governing body real quick, and I'll go. Do you have any idea from the years of 2013 to the year 2018, this current year, tax year, how much tax revenue Stone Lake Phase 1 generated? And if the lots had been uh, taxed at a vacant rate throughout the entire part of the process, once the infrastructure was in place, how much 
that tax revenue would have been. So in, in essence, any idea about what we left on the table just on Stone Lake Phase 1? Haven't had a good reason okay. to look that up. I, <laughs> well, I've had a very good reason to look that up. It's because I was curious to see what a decision like this would mean in real tax dollars for its citizens. And so I'll tell you what, what it was. From 2013 to 2018, we actually collected between all of the taxing entities $84,256.27. If we had taxed them at the vacant rate and what the reasonable rates that are kind of based on what the appraiser has based the vacant lots at, we should have collected $209,960.80. Since we've left one hundred and fifteen thousand dollars on the table just in the in the six years, <coughs> and just on those thirty four lots. Now, if we go and look at Grand Prairie, if we look at River Run, River Trail, if we look at all of those other subdivisions and add that up, we're probably looking at over a million dollars. And then, if you add up all these lots that we're looking at approving now how many more millions of dollars is that going to be over the next several years? <coughs> we have an issue that's on the table right now, and I think we need to fix it because if you say we're, we're, we're not going to do this and we're going to wait for the state legislature, you're going to wait forever. That, that, the legislature, as you know, Carl, you've said it, legisl you're, you're going to rely on Randall Hardy to get the, this done? I mean, you said that recently on an amusement tax. I don't, I, I'm with you. I don't want to wait for the state on everything? Certainly not something like this. So my question before last week, uh, Mayor, was when we find out that it's not, there's no problem with bond council about this, will you seriously take this up and, and, re and, and look at, I think, I think you owe it to yourself to ask staff, I don't even have GIS, I don't have employees, this was just me doing it on my time. But it's important, it's a lot of money. And I think we owe it to ourselves and we owe it to the taxpayer to maybe say this is worth looking at and seeing how difficult this is because I can tell you this, if another community does this and, and we're, we could have been doing this already, it's going to look really bad. It's going to look bad for you guys. It's going to look bad for staff. And when we, we're in an era when we say we need to think outside of the box, well, the problem is, is that when people think outside of the box, they're told all the reasons why you can't do something. I think that the numbers on here, and I will give these numbers to staff, it's my work product, but I'm willing to donate it to the city. I think you owe it to all of us to take a serious look at this, figure out how much money is at stake, because we pass it over on this one today, then you're not being very fair if you then look at these numbers in a couple of week, weeks and tell Mr. Daly, sorry, you didn't, you didn't get here in time. I don't think you're going to be able to do that. In fact, I would advise him to get a good attorney. Um, but you're, if you don't take care of this when it's in front of you now, then I don't think you're ever going to take care of it. And, you know, we're talking Commissioner Hodges. You say the fire department was in there today. I wasn't in the study session, but I read the memo from last week. We got hiring freezes. We're telling city employees they can't get raises. Well, we got taxpayer doll. We have taxpayer re tax revenue sitting on the table, and we're not willing to take it. So, um, I don't blame the developers. They're, they're going to get every dollar they can get, and God bless them. But that's their job. Your job is to look out for our taxpayer dollars. And so, thank you. But I would hope that you would see that. It's not out of the realm of your discretion to take a closer look at this and postpone signing of the development agreement. I don't know if you can go ahead and do the other stuff, but I would, I, I would try to do everything I could possibly do to get language in that development agreement. Thank you. I guess I have a question for the rest of the governing body. Is there any interest? I mean, I've expressed my interest in pursuing this. Um, whether that looks like, um, you know, having staff take a deeper dive at this, 
getting more information on, on, on revenues that we're leaving on the table. But if I'm the only one, then it doesn't advance. And I guess I would just ask my fellow members of the governing body if they have any interest in, in, in pursuing this or not so that we can, I mean, it's, it's, I don't want to dither up here and, and, and not give a clear direction to staff. So if it's just me, that's fine. But I think that we, we owe it to staff um, to let them know whether or not, you know, we want to proceed. Could you be a little more crystal about what we would ask staff to I think in looking into? I think that um, um, given some of uh, Mr. Blanchard's um, comments in terms of idea number two, um, also I could have sworn that there are other communities in the state of Kansas that do, once infrastructure is in, do actually assess at a vacant lot value. And, you know, <laughs> uh, far, far, far be it from me, but obviously um, if those communities can figure out a way to, to do it, I'm not proposing that we're reinventing the wheel. What I'm asking is that, um, I guess a couple of things. One, we take, we take another look at this to see if it's something viable that we can that we can do, and two, um, you know, postpone this item until um, till we can get a clear sense of, of of going forward with this. And failing that, option number three would be, I feel like it's really important to put it on our legislative um, talking points um, to distribute to the legislators for this for the upcoming year. So I guess it's kind of, is there any appetite for hitting pause and, 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 and doing a deeper dive into this? Or is there any appetite for um, trying to work through the legislature if we're not willing to do the first? Those are two, two very different a, yeah. scenarios for what those two persons colloquially would be able to do for us anytime soon. I mean, uh, the legislature might be a three or four year okay. endeavor. All but, right. Well, then I mean, then I'll keep it simple. As far as what we could, yeah, we, we I can would, do ourselves. I mean, I just want to know: is there any interest among us to investigate this? To investigate the ag valuation versus um, vacant lot valuation further? Because <laughs> if there's not, then there's not. Yeah, I don't think Mr. Bingston was allowed to completely answer the question that was asked of him earlier by Mr. Blanchard. Well, I think that was because I asked Mr. Blanchard a question. question back, yeah. <laughs> instead of, <laughs> instead of answering. Yeah. Uh, and I was trying to determine what might be helpful for purposes of the conversation as well. And certainly to begin with, uh, I assure you that the city manager, uh, after we got the indication we got from bond council that it appeared not to be a problem uh, from a bond council standpoint, uh, the city manager consulted with us fully. Uh, and we understood our task to be to objectively look at how one might address this phenomena, if you will, in a way that uh, would then enable the governing body to determine as a policy matter which way they might wish to go. Have, identify a potential solution uh, to, the va to the assessment question. Uh, I think as noted in the memo, option one didn't seem to we found ourselves trying to affect the judgment of the assessor as well as uh, affecting the process and that did not seem uh, prudent to even attempt to go down that path the reason i asked mr blanchard the question i asked uh, for the life of us in looking at and, and maybe there's somebody out there that uh, can address it more definitively. But when you're dealing with the level of discretion that the county appraiser has, 
and you're dealing with the breadth of that definition of agricultural use, and you're dealing with anything that we've been able to see from the cases or any interpretive aspects from uh, BOTA, the breadth with which they're looking at that uh, for whatever reason, I honestly would not know exactly, and the reason I ask about the ascertainable standard, I'm not sure what you would tell a developer or anybody who had those lots what they had to do <laughs> Mm -hmm. to be absolutely sure that the result of that uh, use or whatever they might do with it would assure that the county appraiser would assess it as vacant as mm -hmm. opposed to agricultural. Given the breadth and the in apparent intent of that very broad definition, when it, okay. when it came, if you had asked me, when you asked okay. me, a couple of weeks ago, and I, uh, speaking of underthinking, uh, <laughs> when I responded, hey, welcome to my world, Greg. <laughs> when I responded, well, it's a matter of contract law, and right. you know, in my mind, I thought you define the standard, mm -hmm. you determine, you know, if as a policy matter, it's where the governing body wants to go, you identify the standard, you identify the consequence of failing to perform the mm -hmm. standard, <laughs> and you've got an agreement. And you're right, we're in the context of certainly where we are affording uh, the opportunity for the special assessment financing. And then with what we were able to learn, uh, frankly, over the course of after the direction was given, mm -hmm. as I sit here today, I, when you can grow fescue grass mm -hmm. and still potentially qualify, for well, let me let me answer you this way. Okay. There are probably at least a hundred vacant lots scattered throughout the city. Many of them have fescue grass on them. I'm unaware that the assessor has driven up to any of those in North Salina, the city core, <coughs> anywhere else in town where there's a vacant lot that was just lawn grass or weeds. And the assessor changed that valuation, ch changed that assessed value from vacant to agriculture. So first of all, I would say show me some sort of pattern that would suggest that that in fact would be a problem because the only case I am familiar with is a property that we all are very familiar with over on Greeley. And that is Ben Frick's former property that he grew some kind of crop on I don't even know what it was but it was tall it was but I don't <laughs> think it, it's, it's what I think I think we unnecessarily muddy the waters because I talked to the county appraiser and I asked him what is the process by which you go about assigning a use to a property and he said there is a checklist and I like and I asked him a, a dropout list and because I don't know what the Lauren's probably the person that would know what the list is, but when you go down things and you say, is it this, is it this, and when finally you hit something that says, no, it's not, then it drops out. You're not, you're not that. So there is a, there is criteria that, that goes to saying what is agricultural and what is vacant. And the other side of the coin is all, it, as many lots that you can't find that switched from vacant to agriculture, you're going to find it, you're going to find the other side of the coin, and maybe as soon as this coming January, where how many lots have been reassessed to vacant from agriculture, and I think that's your more likely direction of assessment. The other way is just propping up a straw man and knocking it down, I think, because it's a scenario that is so rare, it's, it's the exception and not the rule. And so while, while I understand the, the legal dilemma, I do think also that the incentive is on the part of the property owner to make sure that if he's concerned about that, if his penalty is now instead of paying $750, I have to pay back the balance of the special assessments, which could, which could be in excess of $35,000 immediately. I think I'm going to do everything that I can possibly do to protest a reassessment to 
agriculture from vacant so that I don't get myself caught in that, in that dilemma. And so I think some of it, we have to put the responsibility on the lot owner to say your penalty is much greater than your benefit by having it done. You may want to pay considerable attention to that to make sure that we don't have to seek an injunction. We don't have to seek any sort of legal recourse. And so I, I just think it's things like that that we can, we can make it very simple and instead of looking for exceptions, we look, you know, we look at a broad way to say, even if we had to, go to file an injunction, is the cost of one or two of those every couple of years worth what we would be receiving in financial benefit for having those tax at a vacant lot? rate. And just the practical stand, I mean, we all hear about up here about how few lots they have and how fast they sell and everything. We're not talking about if they're, if the developers are confident that the turnover on these is going to be quick, they're not even going to be out much. And I understand that one of the developers has, it has voluntarily said, I'm okay with, with paying that fee. I, I don't think we need to paint everybody with the same brush, but I do think that um, everybody would like a fair system. And just one last note, in the blue sheet you generally have a fiscal note, and the fiscal note is your action will cause a certain fiscal reaction. I think in this case, if you make no action, it will make a bigger fiscal reaction. So uh, did you have any more? The, well, the only thing I might mean, just to make sure we're okay. on the, as close to the same page as we can be, the. Uh, we did not uh, raise nor discuss the full acceleration of the specials as a potential damage. As you could probably tell from the discussion, we, right. were, we were focused on your more traditional contract right. remedies. And uh, frankly, well, as we mentioned, concerned about the, uh, anything that would appear to be approximating a substitute for the, for the tax. Correct. Uh, 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 now, again, I don't want to put Ms. Rikoff on the spot too much, but I, but I will. Uh, I don't know, uh, Ms. Rikoff, if you've had any experience with or would have a thought on cities uh, looking to full, uh, uh, any acceleration of uh, specials being due as a result of a failure to perform on a development agreement commitment or not, or, or whether that's uh, unprecedented. Uh, Gina Rikoff with Gilmore and Bell. Um, it, I have never drafted that into a uh, into a development agreement. I'm not aware of that being part of a development agreement before, where uh, a violation of some provision of the development agreement would cause acceleration of uh, the special assessments. You're right; that is not something that we have talked about in the past week as we have explored the the tax related issues, federal tax related issues with respect to the city's bond. Uh, which is how I got involved in, in this question um, because uh, what we were wanting to make sure of is that we are not somehow uh, violating in the federal tax code a provision called the, the uh, a prohibition on private loans. Um, and then also a private use restriction that's also in the federal tax code, um, both of which if you violate those rules, then um, you are not able to issue tax exempt bonds, which again lowers the cost of borrowing, which helps facilitate, I mean, that's at the end of the day, that's uh, a big part of the reason why special assessment financing is attractive um, for, for these developers because of the tax exemption they're able to pass along. Um, I, I think that if the remedy is tied to the special assessments, then that does make the tax analysis more difficult. Um, I'm not prepared to give you a definitive answer standing here this instant about whether that would be permissible or not under the federal tax code and, and cause a problem with the tax exemption on the bonds. Um, it, you know, at the end of the day, I think as we talked about, uh, you know, I, I 
always advise staff, um, we, we probably don't want the federal tax issues related to your bonds to be the thing that drives this policy decision if this is in fact the direction you want to go. Um, and so <laughs> if this is important to you from a policy standpoint, obviously there's a cost trade-off. Um, and you know that is part of the policy decision here. Doesn't mean that you can't do it, it just may mean that it's a, a bit more costly and so you don't get as much of the benefit or uh, you, you can't pass along as much of the benefit of special assessment financing. So I think that's something that we'd have to look at a little bit more to see if it would cause us um, some challenges um, from a, a federal tax standpoint on the financing. I appreciate that. I assumed it wasn't an easy one, but I, with you, particularly with you here, I felt compelled to ask. So yeah, no, thanks. happy to help. So if I may, I've got a handful of things. Um, I, as Greg mentioned, I think we talked through most everything that was described with the exception of the, the, the special assessments becoming due and payable. Um, with respect to examples of uh, vacant lots that find themselves in this circumstance, <laughs> without a doubt, the Greeley property uh, was a topic of conversation. In fact, if you look at our tall grass and weeds uh, exemptions, there is a very specific Salina unique uh, exemption for property maintained for agricultural purposes for an ad valorem uh, assessment or however that's worded. We went so far as to say, okay, if, if you're motivated to um, try to maintain your property for the ag assessment, you still need to trim up the front setback, the side yards, and, and the rear yard. And if you have multiple properties, you can do that around the outside so that your neighbors if they're adjoining you, and Ben always called it silage, or at least that's what I called it, um, but it, if, if you're, they're so inclined, your neighbors have some buffer between that ag use and, and their property. Um, but having said that, a couple years ago when this came up, previously had a conversation with the, the county appraiser, and, and we looked at lots in Grand Prairie, and he, the, he indicated then, and he's indicated recently again, every two years, or once every two years, they physically go out and they inspect the sites, and it's a point in time that they make that assessment, and they one of the things they look for is tire tracks and how they mow it. And so shared with me side-by-side -side, uh, vacant lots in Grand Prairie that were assessed, some were assessed ag, some were assessed vacant, depending on what they saw at that point in time when they went out there. And that's that's how they've applied their their judgment previously and how they intend to continue to apply it. Most recently, um, you know, to your point that other city, other communities, uh, I think is the way you phrased that, um, assess va vacant rather than ag. They do, and so do we. It, it is a lot by a lot um, s circumstance. And so um, Sean Robertson, the county appraiser, t did a search of all the properties that have zero value for improvements. So essentially there's nothing of value structurally on the properties, and then divided those into whether they assessed at a vacant, as a vacant property or whether they were assessed as an ag property. There were 283 of them that were assessed as vacant properties and there were 520 that were assessed as ag properties. Um, so I don't know the story behind those. I, I can look at some of these and just tell they're large industrial acreages that have, you know, the police firing range as an example was previously farmed and got an ag assessment until uh, we purchased it and redeveloped it. So there's those, but then there's individual lots as well scattered throughout town. Um, and then the other thing that we talked about and I touched on in the memo, but I didn't touch on in my verbal report and probably bears a little bit more discussion, is the legal concern about whether we are essentially, you know, we're very clearly having a conversation that this is tax revenue lost and we're trying to regain it in some other way. And there are cases that preclude us from imposing excise fees and taxes. Um, and so there's that that legal concern came up as we tried to, you know, brainstorm option number two. The more, uh, the more we could tie it back to, well, if you don't get assessed by the appraiser, but you're going to pay some some amount in its place, the more it felt like imposition of a tax beyond our authority. And, I, and I'll defer to Greg in terms of kind of the legal uh, parameters of that. But again, I'm repeating myself. But we definitely did not have any conversation about 
in lieu of that approach, just revoking the special assessments and making them due in full. Yeah, personally, I think we're getting into a lot of what ifs and stuff, and it, it, it comes down to other counties. I mean, it's up to our county appraiser to interpret what the lot's used for, whether it's ag or it's a lot. And I think Commissioner Hodges says other counties do that, but I think they do it through their appraiser. I mean, their appraiser goes out and makes that decision. I, I guess I'd have to ask bond counsel if she knows of anyone that's tried to do this through a development agreement. So it, it seems like we're trying to tread into to an area that I'm not sure we, we want to go to. And uh, um, I think if anything, you send a, you know, you, you, if you want to, you can send a, a letter to, your, to the county appraiser and tell them you have a concern with the way things are being appraised. But I think we're trying to circumvent the job and the duties of the county appraiser. And that's where I'm kind of running into to an issue. And I and, and I get that. I, I, I your points um, well well taken. I guess the way I look at it is we're providing financing, and I mean there's it's 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 give and take. <laughs> we're we're providing a low cost financing option for um, developers to put in infrastructure, and I think that they're um, I think it's a give and take relationship and. Um, I think it's incumbent upon um, the developers to understand that there's a maintenance cost that goes in from the time that infrastructure is in place. And so, I mean, I, I, I do, I understand where you're, where you're coming from. And, um, and, and like I said, if, if it's four people up here that aren't interested, and I guess I would just ask if nobody else is interested in pursuing this, then just shut me off now because we could have been done 20 minutes ago. But, um, but if there is, then, you know, I just, just count me as someone who's, who's interested in pursuing it further. Question. When, when the assessor is looking at the property, does the property fall out of the ag designation or does it fall into the vacant <laughs> property because even though the owner is not doing anything that would be an obvious agricultural use that doesn't I would assume preclude the county assessor from still saying it's ag as opposed to a vacant lot because number two I there's some interest in number two but unless the county assessor is part of that agreement you still haven't guaranteed that he or she would uh, assess it uh, as as vacant property. I understand no, so your kind question. Of a rhetorical I do question not know the answer without right. <laughs> speaking to the appraiser. Um, I, I do think from, and I'm going out on a limb here, but I do think from the conversations with the appraiser as well as the Department of Revenue, there definitely is in the back of their mind that, that <coughs> BOTA opinion and how liberal it was or lenient it was and uh, kind of they, at least at the state level, the legislative change seemed to also influence their interpretation a little bit. But I, on a case-by-case -case basis, I do not know. So the issue we have here, and, and I guess the one thing I've not liked about special assessments is that every year we seem to do a last-minute adjustment to our policy, which makes it very hard to make decisions on this and and even if the policy had provisions that I didn't particularly like if we could just get to a policy and keep it there for several years unless some drastic change in our situation occurred it would be a lot easier I mean we've gone from giving 10 15 percent for art in the middle of the street to having curves I mean you know the, the, the basis upon which we're making decisions are far from scientific you know, I think I think one of the things that you've said, Mayor Davis, is you know it's it's hard to set policy when the players change every two years, and I think that's what we're running into. And I don't know how we do this. And you know, uh, I've obviously been a proponent for spatial assessments. I think it's been beneficial. It's been used in our community for gosh ever since I can remember. Um, and again, the the developers obviously are trying to make make a, a living but also those developments I think in the long run have been good for our community but if we're 
if we're running into the problem that Commissioner Davis is talking about, about you know how this is always a moving target and the developers, it's got to be tough for them. I think uh, Mr. Welsh made a good comment, you know, when he was up here a few weeks ago about, you know, we can't, you know, changing the rules in the middle of the game is kind of tough on on somebody that's trying to buy buy ground and somebody's trying to develop. And maybe we look at how do we phase out special assessments, but it's got to be over a, a, an extended period of time. And I don't know if that's 10 years, is it 15, is it 20? You know, I'm just saying that maybe that's something the commissions have to look at. But to be fair to the community, to be fair to the developers, we need to put that out of way. So anybody that wants to develop new ground in, in 10 or 15 years knows that special assessments won't be available. But again, you know, investments have been made in, in, in land because special assessments have always been used. And, you know, that's, you know, our developers aren't large developers. We, we don't have developers coming in here from Wichita, Kansas City, because as we were discussing in there when we were talking about the fire, we're on an island a little bit. We're too far from Kansas City. We're too far from Wichita for them to come in and do 10 or 15 lots as a development probably. So, so we have to do what we can do. And, and special assessments have worked for us over years, but if we feel like there's a different direction we want to go so we can ha quit having these conversations, we need to discuss it, but we need to look into the future far enough that we're fair to everybody. And that's just... And I agree with that, too. I mean, you know, the Saline County appraiser's got a job, and I don't think it's our job to tell him what his job is to do. So that's... And in Commissioner Hodges, you know, if that's something that we feel like needs to be addressed at the state level, you know, we, we can tell them, you know, I don't know how you do that, but, you know, they have their, the, their, the county appraiser has their marching orders, and I don't know if it's, you know, how we can tell him how to do his job or her job, whoever it is, so. I guess I'm, I'm somewhat conflicting you know, from a practical perspective. You know, my personal opinion is once you put a street in, put the sewer in, uh, the purpose for that land has been determined, and it's not going to be to farm farm <laughs> or raise chickens yeah. it's to put a house on it because that's going to be the most value uh certainly early on uh you know so i would say but gosh once we've improved everything up to that property line uh we know what it's going to be used for therefore it you know i would of course i'm not the appraiser uh would say well you know if you can build on this lot tomorrow then it's not agricultural it's it's residential <coughs> Uh, and compared to the specials, $750 a year, I mean, you could use it for something else. It's not a huge amount of money, but still it's the issue of, one, can, you, can we legally do it, and two, and by legally, can we get a guarantee from the county appraiser that he or she would agree to this the, he was pretty that. clear in saying no to yeah. that. And right. As we talked about <laughs> idea one, he was pretty clear that he just did not feel he had the discretion to agree to that approach. Sorry to interrupt, but I, that is no, one answer I do know. Right. <clears throat> uh, Can you clarify? No. The, uh, just on scenario one. Yeah. Uh, and the scenario, I shared this with the, the county appraiser as well, and his response was, the question, the bullet point questions raised in scenario one, his initial reaction was the answer to most of those were no in terms of his discretion um, or his his ability to agree to something kind of alternate to what the, the statutes and his guidance previously provided. But I, I, I don't mean to interrupt your train of thought, Mayor. If you want to finish, I mean, I'm... I'm this is a local train. It's stopping everywhere. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> Um, I, I may be getting late on the train myself, but if in the development agreement, and I think if I understood Mr. Blanchard correctly, if there was a proviso about if you do receive an ag valuation on your land, it becomes incumbent upon you as the property owner to appeal that to a vacant lot. And I may be, I may be mischaracterizing that, <coughs> mischaracterizing, I can't talk, mischaracterization, it's getting too late. Um, if, um, you know, if that's the component in the development agreement that it puts the responsibility on the property owner to appeal an ag value should one be received 
I mean, I think, am I understanding correctly that that's the way you were proposing to go? But I, I'm, to me, it just seems like there's different ways well, out there. And just to clarify, the, the if the question is, could the appraiser be a party to this approach and agree on the front end to appraise it differently because this agreement's in place? No, he didn't. He no. didn't think that he could. Right. No. Right. No, I think what I was saying. And that is that, not to say there yeah, isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. I agree with just, that. Yeah, I, and I understand. I understand that. Yeah, we're not the, the appraiser, but at the same time, if you have in your development agreement that the um, <coughs> that the developer agrees to have land valued as vacant lot as opposed to agricultural land, and they get their property valuation, and it says agricultural, then it would be their responsibility to appeal that to. Uh, to the Board of Tax Appeals and say this is, you know, this is this is valued as, as vacant lot. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe that's wouldn't work either. But like I said, I'm done talking. Yeah. We've, well, we've and I guess the other is that the, when the petition was received, it was received with plans to have it, at least parts of some of these lots uh, assessed as, or they were, Assuming it would be assessed as agricultural until a uh, certain point in time. Yeah, the, the details of the petition speak to allocation of special assessments and ag deferral, but, but the petition the, doesn't speak to what their intentions might be for you know, county tax appraisal. So are these two items necessarily linked at the hip? Uh, if, if we want to consider make, uh, trying to address it by way of development agreement, they are. If yeah, I don't like having things brought up to game time and then changing the rules halfway through the game, but you know, it sounds like the only issue to decide is if we're going to work on a long time, a long term proposal or, or, or policy, uh, we have to decide whether we're going to do it tonight and get it settled before this, postpone mm -hmm. these, or uh, pass these and, and, and decide that sometime before we get the next batch, whenever that's going to be, have a policy that we hope will last a couple of years. Yeah, and you I'm just, that character. Uh, I, I, those are the three yeah. proposals. I'm, I'm not yeah, we're talking about 29 <laughs> lots tonight is all, but yeah, I mean, I think what we're discussing here has got a lot of discussion to ha be had if anything happens, you know. If we're making changes of that type, I think they go out to the future. Th these issues before us and maybe Wheatland coming up in the future, they've all based their economic model on the tool in the toolbox, assess assessment financing that we've been using for decades. Uh, if we want to move away from that model of cooperating with the developers, uh, then that's a valid discussion to have, but I don't think we uh, should make dramatic changes. We have to allow the market to adjust. And so uh, as far as these uh, uh, items before us tonight, I think they need to be passed, and it's a, it should be an ongoing uh, conversation about how what we do with special assessments. I thought Mr. Uh, uh, Welsh uh, made a good point that if you want to back away from them, it should be done gradually. But uh, certainly, dramatic changes shouldn't be done, or we'll just shoot ourselves in the foot again and have no lots and nobody developing anything. Because I'm not hearing much argument against granting the specials. I guess the discussion is whether we link the property assessment during that time until the lot is actually improved with the special assessment development agreement. Correct. And well, I, I can't speak for the commissioners right. about opposition to specials. And I, I may have been hearing wrong. <laughs> my, in my right. opinion, though, that's a conversation also for another day. The way it's presented to you as an action item today does not link it. If, you, if that's something you want to link, I don't think we're prepared to do that on the fly. You would need to postpone that and we can take it up. But as it's currently presented, it's proceeding with special assessments like we have more typically in the past, but the question was raised a week or two ago about the opportunity to link them, um, and that's what's part of this decision then. 
And practically speaking, I'm assuming that we would gain no traction or a final decision on that issue for at least three or four months. And you don't, you don't have to look at me and not disagree on that, but it's just my opinion. I, I don't think it's a November 18th action item. Just, I'm just talking out loud. Mayor, if I may, yeah. I, I don't know if it's too early for a restroom break. Not at all. I was thinking I, about that about 10 minutes uh, ago. <laughs> I ask that uh, because it would, uh, and I don't want to make this too mysterious. I do have a question I'd like uh, to ask the city manager rather than during the course of your meeting. And uh, if that would be appropriate, that would give me that opportunity. Let's take a 10 minute recess. Come back at 625. Thank you. <coughs> All right, call the meeting back into regular session, and I suppose it'd be proper to ask the <laughs> city manager to uh, get us restarted. And I'll defer to the city attorney. Thank you, and I appreciate the opportunity to uh, uh, both consult with uh, the city manager and with bond council on a question that had occurred to me in the course of the discussion. And I wanted to make sure I was keeping uh, example one and example two separate correctly separated in my mind, uh, what, uh, and with the benefit of the conversation with Ms. Rekoff on a comparable, I said, I think reasonably comparable circumstance, the question had to do with the potential for including a provision in the development agreement that would preclude the property owner from protesting a vacant determination, which I believe was offered up as possibly. I, I'm sorry, as you're speaking, I, I looked at my memo and it, the uh, option one that we, as we described it was property owners enter into an agreement with the city to have their property assessed with a residential assessment ratio and or not protest a residential assessment ratio. So, yeah, the first part of that was the, I thought the Focus. defining, the defining disqualifier. Right. right. Um, but as the discussion went on, the point, the point being, um, it seemed to me that you could potentially have an enforceable waiver of that sort of appeal on the part of the property owner, and. Uh, if I may, if Ms. Rekoff doesn't mind, uh, you might, <laughs> might speak to the parallel circumstance where that has been done. <coughs> Just so we're clear, the scenario that we're now talking about would be if the appraiser in their own independent judgment assesses one of these vacant lots as residential, then the agreement provision would be that the owner would not protest that, that assessment, correct? Correct, residential vacant or vacant residential. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So the the corollary um, that we have seen in other development agreements in other communities uh, it has come up in the connection in connection with TIF. Um, and so um, in TIF, you can, uh, as, as I think you all are aware, um, the uh, governing body typically. Uh, diverts the incremental property tax revenues that are generated from a new project uh, to help incentivize that project. So it is a little bit different than the situation that we're talking about here where you have special assessments in one bucket and then we're talking about property taxes generally in this other bucket over here and we're attempting to link the two. Um, but in connection with a TIF, um, we have seen 
uh, in development agreements provisions where a developer that is the beneficiary of the incremental tax revenues that are generated agree not to protest the assessed valuation of the property in the TIF district. Um, and so I think the similarity that, that we're talking about here is a situation where, again, if the assessor of his or her own volition, according to statute, uh, assesses the property as vacant residential, then that property owner, during the time that the special assessments are in place, agrees not to protest that, that valuation. Um, Full disclosure, while that has been included in development agreements, I have never seen that provision litigated. Um, we, we have only seen situations where there has been a threat to challenge the assessed valuation of property within a TIF district. Uh, there have been discussions between the developer and the city that have ensued, and the uh, developer has chosen not to challenge the assessed valuation of that property. So I can't tell you what a court would say in terms of um, the enforceability of a, a provision like that, but I can tell you that we have included that in, in other TIF-related projects or projects where incentives have been granted. Does that and then, cover everything that we... Yeah, I guess I would add one additional detail, and that is I think the expectation would be that a provision like that would, would run with the land. So if the developer sold a vacant parcel to a individual buyer that was going to build their dream home on it five years from now, the, the requirement would run with that land and the consequences start to interrelate that individual ownership and the develop, whatever commitment the developer might have made as part of the development agreement. So uh, we're kind of addressing some of this on the fly, but if the consequences are you unravel the special assessment financing, um, if you've got individual lots sold, I think we'd have to either account for that or have to be okay with that in a relationship. The other aspect, of course, is that one is still left with the uh, remedy. What is the remedy if the property owner does, in fact, appeal? Uh, it would seem that that is where injunctive relief uh, could be sought and would like would be the most likely remedy I would think upon the city uh, becoming aware of any such appeal and then seeking uh, an order from the uh, district court enjoining that property owner from further pursuing the appeal uh, so <coughs> Uh, appreciate your patience as we work through that specific asset uh, aspect of what had been discussed. I realize that leaves questions as to the all of the policy aspects associated with that, but uh, hopefully that's helpful at least in terms of one um, approach that that is available to you if you wish. I still see this is something that we need to look at farther down the line. Uh, Mr. Mayor, I make a motion and we approve resolution 19-7760. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 19-7760. Uh, I guess for further discussion, just ask the city attorney question really to what you just stated under that scenario the persuasion then would have to be upon the county assessors methods of assessing property I mean a long-term uh, solution to having properties assessed as residential vacant I mean it doesn't we're not asking the wouldn't be asking the county assessor to be a part and party of that whatsoever. Uh, correct. And that's what I was wanting to make sure I was parsing correctly. The whole concept is our uh, relationship is with the developer uh, and the developer can make or not make or commitments 
uh, as they might choose. Um, as long as we, my comfort with that is that we are not affecting the judgment or trying to affect uh, the judgment or discretion of the county appraiser as he or she performs uh, his or her job. It's simply that owner saying, I understand if that's the way it comes down at the, at the uh, local level in terms of the classification for assessment purposes, that stands. Thank you. I'm still not 100% comfortable that that's not trying to circumvent the state statute without us doing some more discussions. I mean, it just, that's. I guess my only question is, or I mean, the way the way I understand our feelings now is we're not going to have any further discussions on that, or did I misinterpret that? I mean, well, and I'm speaking only for myself. I mean, I, I, I think the issue that was brought up is is one certainly worth discussion. Um, <coughs> wish you come up with this three years ago, Mr. Blanchard. We could have had three more years of, of revenue, perhaps, but. But it's, it's, it's a good example of how when you rework a policy, rework a policy year after year, all of a sudden the light goes on and says, oh, okay, well, maybe this would be a good tweak to the, to the process. Um, I don't like the idea of leaving money on the table, but on the other hand, I don't like changing the rules of a game right at the very last minute. Now, we weren't obviously smart enough to come up with this on our own. No one suggested it to us before. And uh, the only way that we would be able to change this policy to affect this resolution would be to postpone this resolution. And I'm guessing it would probably take four or five, that's just my guess, four or five months to rework the policy. And then, uh, and then, you know, re-look re at this, this issue. Um, I think, you know, good ideas, but I, I think the overall benefit, uh, you know, for me is <coughs> going to be to move this one along and at the same time look uh, at what we can do for the next round of, of developments that will come before us. Any other comments? I guess my, my only comment, though, is I don't want to, I mean, if this is a non-starter for the governing body, I don't want to have staff spend more time doing more research. And if, if there isn't any anticipation that we would actually do that in the future. So um, I guess I would just, you know, ask for, for clarification on that. I don't, I, I just, I'm not, I don't want to create work for staff. I can only give you my, my opinion. I don't think it's a non-starter. I just think this is. Right, and I understand. Right. I understand I, and I, I would hope that there'd be a motion before we adjourn tonight to get that conversation started. Okay. But uh, I, I don't have a good feeling about holding this one up. Oh no, I understand. Because of our late enlightenment. Again, speaking just for me, we do have a motion and a second on the floor. Any other conversation? All in favor of approving resolution 19-7760, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries four to one. Well, we've just had our break, so we should be good for the, for the, for the next one. Let's go 7.6A, or 7.6, I'm sorry. Uh, I would have to ask for uh, an opinion from either the city manager or the city uh, attorney. Let's on that. try them all together. I think Dan's comments are probably going to be a little all inclusive. Um, okay. It's one big area. <laughs> Item 7.6 Holmes Road Special Assessment District 7.6A, resolution number 19 7763. Providing for the advisability and authorization of a special assessment district for the interim street, sidewalk, and drainage improvements for Holmes Road. From Magnolia Road to a point approximately 2,640 feet north of Magnolia Road as a direct access perimeter street. 
7.6B, resolution number 19-7764, providing for the advisability and authorization of a special assessment district <coughs> for interim street sidewalk and drainage improvements for Holmes Road from a point approximately 2,640 feet north of Magnolia Road to Cloud Street as a direct access perimeter street and 7.6C. Resolution number 19-7765, providing for the advisability and authorization of a special assessment district for the full standard street sidewalk and drainage improvement for Holmes Road from Magnolia Road to a point approximately to Cloud Street as a direct access perimeter street to a full standard. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. I've handed out a revised blue sheet and I did the markups. So you'll see there's just a few areas where we made them blue, but I'm just gonna I'm gonna just gonna go through the background and start at the top here. This is three different benefit districts: um, Magnolia Road, uh, north of Magnolia Road on Holmes. So we've talked about Holmes and Markley for quite a while. Talked a bit about this a little bit with Markley, and we have Holmes over there, which is. Um, Magnolia Hills, Inc. is a um, quarter mile north of Holmes. Is that one better? Thank you. Yeah, that is much better. Thank you. Right here is basically Magnolia Hills, Inc. And then Wheatland Valley is here. So for the first uh, benefit district, we're talking about this half mile right here in this area. And it, uh, Dry Creek is here. Or, or that, I can't remember if that's west. East Dry Creek. Uh, basically a pretty large area and then Magnolia Hills owns these two properties along uh, homes so the idea would be if they develop their property there which they're looking to do as they move from west to east we just talked about this one being developed for Markley this area would be served by homes and comprehensive plan does show uh, residential development going that direction and the interceptor sewer line runs right through here and then goes north following the East Dry Creek all the way to our sewer plant. So there's sewer out there. And as they uh, move towards the east and uh, start to affect Holmes Road basically with traffic, Holmes Road's already got some, tr you know, 200 and some cars on it a day, which is not a large amount, but it is starting to near um, the idea where it would be nice if it was paved. And there's a few, you know, there's some houses out there and as development occurs, once you start getting up into 250 car range or a vehicle range, washboarding is pretty common with a gravel road, a lot of dust, a lot of maintenance needs to happen on gravel roads. And so uh, the previous county engineer was, uh, 250 was kind of the number they used when they tried to uh, keep roads improved. So that's the number we're using here. Um, whether or not that's you know, whether that needs to be higher or, or whatever, um, that's we give ourselves some leeway there with these uh, resolutions and agreements. So I guess as I go down the first page, Holmes number one involves this first half mile north of, of uh, Magnolia. Approximately two million, a little bit over two million dollars is our estimated cost to make it an interim standard. And the first action definitely deals with, with Holmes just with Holmes 1. If you go to the th second page, uh, the documents there that I left with the blue, the blue uh, lettering or the blue uh, track changes, same th uh, language we, we've added to this with these to these documents. Construction of the improvements shall not convince, commence until final plan is approved for the adjacent Wheatland uh, Development Company incorporated property to the north which doesn't impact Holmes number one. This is just Magnolia Hills Inc. property um, for platting purposes, basically 26.39 acres in the Holmes number one. Could you outline those on the board? Just Yeah, John, just go to, go to the third, Holmes three, if you don't mind. Okay. So there's Wheatland right there. And there's Magnolia Hills Inc. And Magnolia Hills Inc. right here as well. And Holmes is one mile from here to Cloud, which is right up here. So number one would be just number the... Number one is the first half mile, just along Magnolia Hills, <laughs> Inc. right here. 
So that would only affect Magnolia Hills, correct. not correct. We the not Wheatland. And correct. The second is Wheatland. Second is Wheatland. Right. As we go to the north, so really we have petitioners for these. If you try to take them all at a time, I guess I really take them all at a time. The first petitioner is Magnolia Hills for the south half, half mile. The second petitioner, second for homes number two, is the north half, which is Wheatland Development Company. They own the whole west side. And then for homes number three, which is really the whole mile for the ultimate improvements, uh, full standard improvements many, many years down the road when we hit 6,500 cars a day. So that's homes one, two, and three are those different uh, districts. Thank you. Does that help? Okay. Mm -hmm. And then as we, since there are just the petitioners on this west side, homes or uh, Magnolia Hills, Inc. and Wheatland, any other property outside of them, they're not asking to be in this district. They're, um, again, similar to Markley, is if they plat or if they develop in the future, then they would be subject to um, this improvement district. But if they don't, then they never have to never have to be a part of that. Moving on to page three, um, we did have a few changes to homes number one, or actually homes number two and three, just to make make the math add up. We had some bad math and some areas that we had transposed and it was frantically putting together documents last week trying to get them all right. Um, here's the pile of documents that we put together for these items and generally got them close but not quite right when we actually reviewed them and reviewed them again and reviewed them again. And, and then shared them with the developers and reviewed them again. So anyway, this is, we got them right now, finally. But that's what those, that's why those numbers are not correct in this, in the word that weren't initially correct in the blue sheet. Um, moving on down page three. Um, there's a lot in here about um, debt limit and temporary note issuance that was, that was added by uh, Debbie have questions on that Mike can help Mike can probably help try to answer that um, these documents like I said have been amended to make sure all the I's are dotted and T's are crossed so we have amended documents so any action we have today is going to be as amended I guess over the last many years we've talked about special assessments for this area and what impact do these developments have on them so in this case, uh, the last um, study session on August 5th and on August 19th, uh, at that time, uh, the commission thought 100% specials here, whereas in Markley, it's 25, it was 25%. This area is pretty, not a lot of traffic, pretty low development thus far, so uh, there was 100% specials. So that's what these um, uh, documents reflect for this one. That's the main change from this one to Markley. So what have I left out, Mike? No questions? Do questions? Um, you have anything else? The conversation we've explain? had about 12, 6, 8, 19, and the timing of being able to petition before construction still applies. Mm -hmm. um, What's the, the count on uh, Holmes Road currently? Do we have any traffic idea? Traffic count? 220-ish. So we're 30 a, away from that. Yeah. Point. Yeah, and, and the, the conversation we had previously about some added language in the resolution. There's two things that are probably of note from the yep. last time we spoke. One is the provision that the traffic count has to be made and met, and then in the discretion of the city, when it's in the best interest of the city to proceed, mm -hmm. then it can pre proceed. So if we find ourselves at 250, 260, 270, and we're looking at kind of the, the timeline, or looking at the traffic out there and say, now's not the time we have sufficient discretion to to delay going forward so again if we're looking at Holmes Road and we're close to the 250 now and let's say in three or four years for some reason the developments to the the north happen or whatever and Holmes Road hits a level where you want to have minimum street standards if if these subdivisions have not been plat platted they right. would not join in. Right. That That's the other revision to it, which right. is called out in blue in, in the staff report is they they aren't required to uh, participate or we don't have a valid district if they haven't been platted. So 
Um, but if they're not platted, I'm not sure what contributes to the traffic count. To, I'm not sure to what get contributes there. to 220 um, right now. That right. seems like a lot out there for um, what there is. But so, and we we had some conversation with the developer uh, of Wheatland Valley in particular about you know what might contribute to to get to the 6,500 number and. I just, personally, I, I see all what traffic is going east turning south to Magnolia. I'm not sure they're headed north to Cloud, but um, we tried to set those thresholds based on engineering design standards and and uh, <coughs> so that we have some predictable criteria that we've all agreed on in advance. And I'm, I'm repeating myself, but this is very much a, a proactive approach to get the district in place when when we have the authority to, to require it as part of the platting so that we don't find ourselves having approved the plats and it, now we we can't put the district together and we're struggling to figure out how to pay to improve Holmes Road. Um, sorry, um, it's, it, it, it's been a while, but um, we are, the costs are going to be recovered for this with the exception of the portions that have, that when everybody connects up, we will collect from the from the benefit district properties whenever they whenever they choose to hook up to the the utilities. Is that am I? Yeah, this and our and our expense is just basically the carrying costs right. and the time value of money and and right. that kind yeah. of stuff. Okay. It, and if correct. they should never choose right. that, that was to the point I was hook up, make. if it if it then, if it continues to be you know undeveloped farm ground. That could be that for an extended amount of time, or <coughs> theoretically, it could be never. Um, I think it, you know, at some point there's going to be de development demand, but I can't say how soon. Okay, so this is a little different from just the way I understood it several months ago, and that there would be a certain trigger for properties east of that midpoint line, and that block between Holmes and, and uh, Markley. And this is switching it to traffic count coming out on Holmes as opposed, yeah. it wouldn't matter yeah. really how yeah. many houses were built in that area, it's the traffic count that's going to be the trigger. Right. Yeah, that that has been the model for a while now. And recognizing that as the development occurs and as they connect to Holmes, they're going to generate traffic. Um, that is the threshold that I think we've had for a bit. The part of the conversation was what's the connectivity of platting across that east line? That was and my next question: when when, right. when when is a connection to homes required as far as number of houses and not knowing what the plat looks like necessarily? But right. what triggers because you could build the houses slow enough that you never you just make people go. Right, you, go west to Mac you, to uh, It could be Markley. phased west to east, and that traffic could continue to go to Markley, which is why it's all the more important to get this benefit district in place before that planning occurs. So that even though they may be in the habit of going to Markley, they are part of the benefit district and subject to the special assessments when the improvements are made. Um, What's the trigger from a safety perspective as to when? There has to be a connection to well, homes. Dealed with it, dealt with that platting and fire. You know, right. dealt with fire. It'll, that'll all as the, as it as it plats, right. and that's exactly when that gets dealt with with the phasing approach. And, and that's more a function of number of entrances to the subdivision than it is, you know, kind of stopping uh, traffic above a certain number. It's just when there's there's um, a certain number of households, you need a second entrance point for public safety reasons. Do we know off the top of our head what that number is for? Now, would that be? I'm assuming there's going to be a connectivity between Magnolia Hills and Wheatland, or it may, I may make that a question as opposed to a, an assumption. It, yes. There, thank you. Yes. Uh, so there would be alternate exits then, but so there'd be a trigger for a certain number of lots in that whole. Right. I guess almost mm, I well, so, sure. half a square mile. Magnolia Hills currently has multiple entrances, which mm -hmm. satisfies the requirement, and then Wheatland Valley would need to be platted accordingly as well. Yeah, they've, they've proposed two on Markley currently, Wheatland Valley has, with their <coughs> preliminary plat. So, you know, we've, we've seen a, one to two on Holmes with the Magnolia Hills 
preliminary plat as well. So we'll just have to see where where that ends up. But at least there's this 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 is this um, gets them over the hurdle of Holmes Road. Now they can actually proceed with platting and how to phase it and how to connect and when to connect and how many houses they can build. That can all get dealt with now. It, it was muddied so much before with this Holmes Road thing that they couldn't really proceed forward. And yeah, by ordinance, we said if you don't have a plan for the perimeter road, right. you can't get your plat approved. So they, their plat approval is dependent on us having figured out this financing arrangement. So if the houses were constructed from west to east, but the traffic count just jumped to 400, mm -hmm. we could invoke yes. the that. Yep. And need to, need to do it now. Not not to confuse the conversation further, but if you harken back to past approaches, we tried to do consent to specials where that consent to special carried forward with each property, but the district technically hadn't been formed. And when you come back however many years later and say, um, even though it was probably in your closing paperwork, uh, now's the time, uh, th this approach is much more effective in having the district formed and in place and ready to proceed as you've described when when the traffic count is met is there any time limit time, uh, expiration on the benefit district no okay. well that was all my questions sorry thank you we are open for comments going once twice all right bring it back to the commission Okay, we'll do one at a time. Mayor Davis, I move we approve resolution number 19-7763, authorizing a spatial assessment district for the interim standard street, sidewalk and drainage improvements for Holmes Road, for Magnolia Road, to a point approximately 2,640 feet north of, Ma of Magnolia Road <laughs> as a direct access perimeter street as amended. Second. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 19-7763 for the south one half of Holmes Road in the region being discussed. Any further comments, questions? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries four to one. Any action on 7.6B? Mayor Davis, I move we approve resolution number 19-7764, authorizing a spatial assessment district for interim standard street, sidewalk, and drainage improvements for Holmes Road from a point approximately 2,640 feet north of Magnolia Road to Cloud Street as a direct access perimeter street as amended. Second. Moved and seconded to approve resolution number 19-7764. For the improvements to Holmes Road in the northern one half of the stretch of Holmes Road we've been discussing. Any further comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries four to one. Okay. Mayor Davis, I move we approve resolution 19 7765, authorizing a spatial assessment district for the full standard street, sidewalk, and drainage improvements for Holmes Road from Magnolia Road to a point approximately to Cloud Street um, as a direct access perimeter street to a full standard as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve resolution 19-7765. I just have one question. So until that very high traffic count would be reached, then Holmes Road would look like Magnolia does now? Uh, it would be to an interim street Jeez. standard, so similar to what Markley looks like. I meant like, to say, or? I'm sorry, Markley. Okay. Too many M's. <laughs> so, thank you. Okay. All right. The new interim standard does include sidewalk on at least one side, so. Okay. Which would be good for connectivity if there are kids out there. Not sure where they're going, but at least they could get to the corner. All right. Uh, any other questions? Okay, all in favor of uh, resolution 19-7765, say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Nay. Motion carries four to one. And we can move to item 8.1, development business. 
Item 8.1, application Z19-7A and P19-33A. 8.1A, amended application Z19-7A, requesting a change in zoning district classification from RS residential suburban to PC6 planned heavy commercial <laughs> on a one half acre unplatted tract of land located on the north side of Beverly Drive, west of Broadway Boulevard, addressed as 1430 Beverly Drive. 8.1 AA's first reading ordinance number 19-11022. 8.1 B is consider acceptance of the offered utility easement dedication from JLF Properties LLC to serve the Forshee addition, a one lot plat of a 0.51 acre tract of land located on the north side of Beverly Drive, west of Broadway Boulevard. Mr. Andrew. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. Items 8.1 A and B relate to a property on the north side of Beverly Drive, uh, west of B Broadway Boulevard. And this lot and two lots directly east were given an RS residential suburban designation in 1977 when the city was rezoned and <coughs> remapped. Uh, the applicant purchased this property in February of this year and met with city staff about constructing a commercial storage building on the site. And uh, we advised the applicant that the uh, RS zoning designation in place would not allow that to occur. And so he filed an application to rezone this property to C6 heavy commercial and is proposing to remove the existing dwelling and garage and construct a commercial <coughs> storage building similar to the buildings to the north on Armory Road. The C6 designation was requested because there was an existing C6 zone property uh, directly to the west. This property has never been platted and so the property also needs to be platted prior to that zoning change taking effect. Um, the applicant believes that this property is no longer suitable for residential use and it's more suitable for commercial use. He desires to build a storage building to support um, his maintenance supplies for residential rental properties that he owns in the vicinity. And uh, the original application was heard by the Planning Commission on June 18th, and they voted 9-0 to zero to recommend that this property be converted to a planned commercial district with use of the property limited to indoor storage of personal items and equipment. And part of the reason for that was that there were neighboring property owners who appeared and were concerned that this might be built as a storage building to start, but that it could transform into something else if there were straight C6 zoning in place. So that recommendation went to you in July. You concurred with that recommendation and directed Mr. Forshe to amend his application to plan C6 and to prepare and submit a site plan for the property to be reviewed concurrently with the rezoning request. His application has now been amended, a site plan, site development plan depicting the new building has been submitted. And Mr. Forshee is requesting City Commission approval of his plans to construct a 3,600 square foot metal storage building on the site. And so if you're looking at the orientation there, the uh, property on the right is Beverly Drive and to the north is on the left hand side. So this, this is the street, this is the building, this is the phase two building, this is the property to the east. And so his proposal is to build a 3,600 square foot building here with a future addition on, on the back side. The building would be 45 by 80 with the 45 foot dimension facing the street. You have the discretion to review, to request revisions to, or to attach conditions of approval to the site development plan that he has submitted. You also have the authority to delete potentially incompatible uses from a planned commercial district. So we, we received the site development plan and we scheduled an October 15th public hearing before the Planning Commission to review the plans. The neighboring property owners were notified of the hearing, they received copies of the applicant's plan. Unlike the uh, June hearing, none of the neighbors on Beverly Drive appeared or spoke at the October hearing. And so, um, 
the applicant does not have any interest in rehabilitating the existing dwelling or redeveloping this lot commercially. He doesn't think it's a desirable home site or that Beverly Drive is a desirable place for new home construction. So the question before you this evening is whether you view this property as more suitable for continued residential use or conversion to limited commercial use. Um, if you've driven the area, um, this is the north side just has a mix of commercial and residential uses. There's really no defined character. There was concern expressed at the original hearing that um, the storage building could be converted to another more intense use or a higher traffic generating use. And so the question for you this evening is having reviewed the plan and your ability to delete incompatible uses from the district and the control that comes from controlling the site plan, whether you think that sufficiently addresses the neighbor's concerns about impacts on their property. Um, all utilities are in place uh, to serve this building. Um, Beverly Drive is not a residential street. It's classified as a collector street and it carries about 1,400 vehicles a day. <laughs> so it's, it's not a typical residential street. And um, it's kind of a transition area between solidly industrial or light industrial to the north and commercial uses um, to the east on Broadway and then to the south is solidly residential. So the specific plan, and I think, John, we have a, a elevation drawing, but this is just a, a typical representation. The building on the screen is quite a bit larger than what the applicant is proposing to build, but it is representative of the type of style of building. The overhead doors that he's proposing would face towards the west. The building, the side of the building would face Beverly Drive. So there'd be a 45 foot frontage facing Beverly and the initial depth would be 80 feet. If he does the addition, about 29% of the lot would be covered by building. Um, it's a basic metal building and there, he is proposing to have wainscoting uh, that he'll put around the building, but he's not proposing any windows at this time. Uh, so part of your role in looking at the site plan and building the design is whether you think that design is compatible with surrounding development on Beverly Drive and Armory Road. There would be one off street parking space provided and he's provided a space for that west of the building. I would note that the minimum building setback in C6 and most of our districts is 25 feet. He's actually proposing to set this building back 50 feet, so it'll be quite a bit farther back than other buildings on Beverly Drive. Because of that, he has a much larger front yard green space, and he's proposing on his landscape plan the planting of trees here along Beverly Drive. And then because there's a residence to the east, there would be a six foot screening fence and then a landscape buffer on the east. So the applicant's plan conforms with all of our landscaping requirements. And the Planning Commission conducted a public hearing on the rezoning request and the request for site plan approval on the 15th of October. No members of the public appeared or spoke at the hearing. Uh, the Planning Commission made two recommendations. First, they recommended re approval of a zoning change to planned C6 and uh, with the use limited to um, commercial storage of building materials, vehicles, and equipment. And then their second recommendation was to approve the site development plan to allow both phase one, the 3,600 square foot storage building and a future addition for phase two. And then they approved that subject to conditions that the use of the building be limited to commercial storage of building materials, vehicles, and equipment only. So five years from now, somebody could not open an auto repair business or a sign contractor or any of those without coming back before this body to make that change. All the storage of building materials and equipment has to be maintained inside the building. The building will have a gutter and downspout system to direct runoff to Beverly Drive and away from neighboring property owners. And then that 
development of the site will be in accordance with the approved site development plan and landscape plan which are incorporated by reference. So any deviations that he might make in the future would have to be reviewed and approved if he wanted to, to change anything. And if he wanted to change the use, he would have to come back before this body or a future buyer would have to do that. So your options relating to the um, zoning action and the site plan would be if you concur with the Planning Commission's two recommendations, the attached ordinance rezoning this half acre track to plan C6 and approving the site development plan for storage building with a future addition should be approved on first reading. If you um, want to approve the ordinance but not include phase two, option two would be to approve uh, the ordinance and the proposed site plan but for phase one only. That means that should he choose to do phase two in the future, he would come back before you and have to get approval to do that. If you disagree with the recommendation of the Planning Commission, you have two options. One, you could send it back to them and state your reasons for disagreeing with the recommendation or if you have four votes today, you could overturn their recommendation and deny this application. So the uh, site development plan is essentially linked to the ordinance. So if you approve the attached ordinance, you would be approving the site plan. Um, if you think that major revisions need to be made to the site plan, you should send this item back to the Planning Commission. The companion item, the plat, is a separate and distinct action. And uh, even if you don't choose to approve the zoning application, it would still be beneficial to have a plat of this property. So with that, I'd be open to any questions you have about 8.1A, the, the zoning application and site plan. Mr. Forshee is here if you have any questions of him. Just one, is there any plan to have any, I know the signage will be addressed, but any uh, lit signs or spotlights on the property or the building? I would let Mr. Forshee address that. He, I believe he reported to the Planning Commission that he has no plans um, to have any signs on the property. The sign code would allow him to have signs and in a commercial district signs may be illuminated. But he indicated at this time he doesn't plan to put any signs on the property because it's going to be primarily for his private use. It's not really anything that's open to, to the use of the public. And there was a description of the lighting. I forget the exact term? Well, uh, we generally at this stage don't have a site lighting plan, but if he is if he is planning to install site lighting in the future, he will have to submit a site lighting plan and cut sheets so that we can determine that where and how the lights are installed will not generate light spill. So we generally get cut sheets of those lighting fixtures to make sure they're cast down and not aimed at neighbors. And what's the usual procedure when it's planned commercial and there are going to be two distinct phases? Do you historically typically approve both at the same time or do you have them come back? Um, it depends on how much information they provide in their initial submittal. Um, sometimes applicants don't think of phase two till later. He has thought about phase two. He has shared his plans for phase two, the neighbors got an opportunity to reviews, review phase two. So um, because he's providing that information to you, um, he's, he's being very transparent on what his two phases are. And so in this, this case, since he's shared his plans with you, it would not be un <laughs> unusual to approve both phases now. It just means that when if there is such a time in the future, he can't deviate from that. He, he can't increase the size. It's You would be approving that dimension for phase when, two. And when he goes to do phase two, he'll have to get a building permit. He'll have to get and a building permit. at that time, we will review, we'll review the plans to make sure that they're consistent right. with this. If they're not consistent with this, then he would have to come back before the body and amend his plans. But if you approve 
phase one and phase two, it is this plan right there, and he can't do anything different than that. And that, and that, that was yeah. what I wanted to find out ultimately. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Forcey, I assume. <laughs> <laughs> if you wanted to address this, feel free. We certainly give you the time if there's anything you'd like to say. Oh, Jeremy Forshee of Surrey, Kansas. Uh, on phase two, we just threw that out now. I, we don't have any immediate plans for that, but when you're paying architects and applying for your permits, they're not free, so it's a lot easier to do all that now. <laughs> we just thought it, would, it, it might not ever happen, but if it, if it does, it's there. Um, just to uh, just throw this out to the commission, um, that area of town has a lot of vagrants and stuff in that, so clearing the site off is really going to help that area out. I mean, I don't know if you could pull that picture up this, with the trees and stuff in it, but the county has a problem with, there's a tent facility basically out in those trees out north of all that, so... Um, we own quite a bit of that chunk of Beverly Drive, and you know, you guys have a problem in the county. I don't know where the line sets for sure, but just wanted to let everybody know I, I don't tear down houses lightly. I mean, this this house is deceiving from the front. It has structural damage in the basement, which we fight quite often in Salina, Kansas, and we, we're not tearing it down because we, it was easy fix up. So I just wanted you guys to know that that's not common on what I do and what the city does, tear them down, build buildings on it. But there is a problem out in there, and that's kind of why we're cleaning that area up. Yeah, and I, I'd like to thank you for, for making an investment in this area. And, and I do like the planned commercial development side of this, because I think we've, you've done a nice job with the, with the landscaping and the buffers, and, and I think with trying to protect the residential homes around there. So I want to make sure I thank you for that in advance. So. Any more questions for me, or that answer anything? Nope. Right, thank thanks. you very much. Any questions, comments, concerns from the public? Bring it back to the commission. Mr. Mayor, well, I mean, we have two <coughs> two separate items, correct? Yeah. Or okay. Address on the ordinance first. Yep. So I uh, I would move, Mayor, that uh, the City Commission concur with the recommendations of the Planning Commission and uh, approve Ordinance Number. Uh, 191102 rezoning this uh, 0.51 acre track to PC6 and approving the proposed site development plan. Second. And and done the development plan, I think we'll make sure we add for the new storage building with the future addition. Would that be correct? Yeah. yeah. Phase one and two. Yeah. So, yeah. Okay. And the, the number for the you were reading. One nine one one zero two two. Thank you. Okay, I just yeah. couldn't. I knew it had. Thank you. Appreciate that. Okay, it's been moved and seconded to approve on first reading ordinance number nineteen dash one one zero two two. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries five nothing. Thank you. And just quickly on the plat, John, if you want to put <laughs> put up, there's a companion item eight point one b. And this property has never been surveyed and platted, so Mr. Forshe has retained the services of a survey to establish the boundaries of this half acre lot. This is a companion plat, and Westar, now Evergy, requested a 10 foot utility easement across the north 10 feet. That has been provided, and so if you concur with um, accepting this plat and dedication, a motion should be made to authorize the mayor to sign the plat and accept the offered utility easement dedication on behalf of the city. Any questions, concerns? Any comments from the public? Right, any action from the city? Mayor Davis, I move that we accept the offered utility easement dedications from JLF Properties, LLC, to serve the 4C, ad, 4C addition, a one-lot plat of a 0.51-acre tract of land located on the north side of Beverly Drive, west of Broadway Boulevard. Second. It has been moved and seconded to accept the offered utility easement dedication from JLF Properties, as just read. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? 
Motion carries five nothing. Uh, 8.2. Item 8.2, resolution number 19-7766, expressing support for the nomination of the National Bank of America 100 South Santa Fe to the National Register of Historic Places and Register of Historic Kansas Places. Thank you, Mayor. Commissioners, I will just warn you that throughout I will be referring to this as the National Bank of America or NBA building, even though some of you may know it as the UMB Bank building, but it was the NBA Bank for a much longer period of time. So this um, building is located at the southwest corner of Iron and Santa Fe. The building occupies an entire lot, so it's 50 feet wide and 120 feet long. And the original four-story building was constructed in 1923, and then there was a comprehensive remodeling done in 1966. And just to avoid any confusion, which I had at the initial um, review, because 1966 is over 50 years ago, the significance of those improvements have taken on historic qualities in their own right because even the 1966 uh, revisions were are over 50 years old. So uh, Blue Beacon International purchased this property from UMB Bank and they retained the services of Brenda Spencer with Spencer Preservation to produce a National Register nomination for this building. The City of Salina received a notice from the State Historic Preservation Office in September and we received a copy of the nomination form and it was provided to us to provide an opportunity for the Salina Heritage Commission and the Salina City Commission to make their recommendations about the proposed nominations. And we have a 60-day comment period so our comments are due to the state by November 15th of this year and the, the state board will meet on Saturday the 16th to consider this nomination. If it's approved it will be on, on, uh, entered on the Register of Historic Kansas Places and then it will be forwarded on to the National Park Service to consider a National Register nomination. Uh, the purpose and the primary benefit to the property owner is if the uh, designation is made it does make the property owner eligible for certain financial incentives, um, specifically federal and state rehabilitation tax credits. And those tax credits can be used to provide funds to preserve and rehabilitate the building's character uh, defining features. I would point out that up until 2013, the placement of a building on the National Register had um, more concern for neighboring property owners because the state of Kansas had what was referred to as environs review and the Heritage Commission had to review anything that happened within 500 feet of a National Register property. And so there were a lot of projects that got swept into that <coughs> review. That was eliminated by the state legislature and so now the focus is on what happens to this building and not what happens in the environs of this building. Um, there are certain criteria for um, having eligibility for the National Register and um, one of those is that the property is associated with events that have made a significant contribution to the broad patterns of Salinas history and this um, bank dates back to 1887 when it was first established um, in the city and we have provided a lot of background information in the report there for things that occurred uh, in the early 1900s and then there was a decision made to purchase property at this location, tear down the building that was there and in 1922 they began construction of this building which at the time was considered the most modern office building in the city. Uh, there was a grand opening October 11th, 1923. Uh, this property observed its 100th anniversary in 1987 
after having gone a, re a renovation in 1966. Uh, but just some of the firsts that it had in Salina, it was the first banking institution to have banking by mail, the first to have an installment loan department, the first with walk-up banking, and the first facility that had drive-through banking in the city. So. Um, the National Bank of America was purchased by UMB Banks in 1993. The other criteria that's important is whether the building embodies distinctive characteristics of a type, period, or method of construction that represents the work of a master or that possesses high artistic values or that represent a significant <coughs> and a distinguishable entity. Um, John will have to correct me of how many buildings in downtown Salina were designed by white and white architects, but they designed a, no, no, a number of notable buildings in Kansas City, Missouri, as well as several in Salina, but it was white and white architects who designed the original building in 1923, and then Wilson and Company Architects was the designer for the 1966 remodeling of the exterior and interior. And so the nomination that's before you reflects both the characteristics of the original um, 1923 construction as well as uh, those things that were updated in 1966. But the nomination form indicates, um, which is the reason for its potential eligibility, that there is still a high degree of historic and architectural integrity to the building. So the Heritage Commission had a public hearing. There was notice provided to all owners within 200 feet of this property. The Heritage Commission made a motion and approved it four to zero, recommending to you, the governing body, that this building should be made eligible for listing on the Register of Historic Kansas Places and the National Register of Historic Places. And they made three findings. One, the 1923 Bank of America and the 1966 remodeling retain a high degree of interior and exterior integrity that still clearly portray the building's original design and function. This bank and building is associated with events that have made a significant contribution to Salinas' historic development and the building embodies distinctive characteristics of a type, period, <coughs> or method of um, construction. And so your options this afternoon or evening would be to concur with the recommendation of the Salina Heritage Commission, finding that this building meets the applicable criteria of eligibility for nomination to the state and national register. And we have prepared a resolution for your consideration that would support that nomination. Or you could disagree with the recommendation of the Heritage Commission and find that this does not meet the applicable <coughs> criteria, in which case you should decline to approve the attached resolution of support. Um, if you do concur with the recommendation, the resolution um, would be approved, signed by the mayor, and we would submit that to the State Historic Preservation Office so they would have that when they meet on the 16th of November. Um, Guy Walker is here on behalf of Blue Beacon International and uh, DMA Architects here locally has been working with um, Blue Beacon on their work that's being done on the building. But with that, I'd be open to any questions. Um, any, Mr. Berger is here as our architectural historian and any details about the building, he's much more familiar than I am. And then Mr. Walker's here for any questions you have about their reasons for seeking the nomination. Right. Oh, this, isn't, this isn't a question, it's a, it's a compliment. I don't know how much is due to John Berger and how much is due to Brenda Spencer, but I really enjoyed reading that National Register nomination application. It was very well done and it's always fun to see the ephemera from the era. Um, so I just want to say well done. It was, it was really neat. And best of luck to um, um, uh, the walkers and, and lighthouse properties because when I was director of Salina downtown one of my biggest fears was that that building was going to become vacant and I'm very grateful that you saw the potential for investment in that building so thank you very much I'm very glad that it's being saved 
I'm just thinking how out of place that building must have looked in 1923. I mean, it's with, with you look at the buildings around it, but it's withstood the test of time. There. Well, uh, unless you'd like to say something, Mr. Walker. Yeah. All right. Any action to be taken by the commission? Mayor Davis, I move we concur with the recommendation of the Salina Heritage Commission finding that the National Bank of America meets the applicable criteria of eligibility for nomination to the National Register of Historic Places and direct staff to submit a resolution of support to the State Historic Preservation Office recommending the historic listing. Second. All right. I'll do this. Quickly been moved and approved to, I mean, moved and seconded, <laughs> to concur with the Salina Heritage Commission finding uh, for nominating the National Bank of America building. Thank you. <laughs> that is Resolution 19-7766. All right. Thank you for that assistance. I was looking for it here. Um, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 nothing. <coughs> We move to 8.3. Item 8.3, resolution number 19-7767, authorizing the mayor to execute a license agreement with Blue Beacon International Incorporated to allow an outward swinging exit door and associated handrail in the public alleyway on the <coughs> south side of Iron Avenue, east of Santa Fe Avenue. Thank you, Mayor and Commissioners. This is a... Um, project related to the same property and Blue Beacon Inter International's efforts to um, renovate the space and make it more attractive for office users. And just as a refresher, um, we have things that occur from time to time where the public interest is served by private use of the public right-of-way as long as that use doesn't conflict with the public use of that right-of-way and the mechanism that has historically been used in the city of Salina is for the city commission to grant permission for limited private use of that right of way through a license agreement. And so a license agreement is specifically limited to a purpose. It's subject to termination in the event that the public interest later requires the use of the right of way that conflicts with the private use. So the request that's before you today is consider approval of a license agreement with Blue Beacon International to allow an outward swinging exit door and associated handrail um, that would extend into the public alleyway uh, on, that's located on the south side of Iron East of Santa Fe. And um, as we noted, this property and the property next door were purchased by Blue Beacon International. They are uh, developing plans to create renovated office space within these buildings. As part of this project, they're proposing to construct a new five-story elevator and stair tower on the south side of the building and directly behind the building at 104-106. So where you see that fire escape is where the, the stair tower would be located in this location. And it will provide exiting for both the four-story building and the two-story building um, to the east at 104 South Santa Fe. And because of the uh, proposed use and occupant load of the building, the building code requires that the door in question swing in the direction of the path of travel, meaning it must swing outward so that it doesn't impede the exiting in an emergency situation. The way that has been addressed um, in a number of locations downtown is that the property owner or their designer recesses the doorway into an alcove and then the door swings out, doesn't extend out into the public right-of-way. And the building code actually prohibits outward swinging doors that swing into a public right-of-way. But in this case, the elevator and stair tower is combined. It's only 23 by 23 feet in size, and the architects determine that there's insufficient space on the ground floor to create a recessed doorway. So they're proposing to have an outward swinging door that would swing out into the alley, and the building official has indicated that he would authorize that, provided that handrails would be required on either side to protect 
passers-by, alerting them to the outward swinging door. These handrails will extend into the alley right-of-way, and that's what ne necessitates the grant of a license agreement. So there has been a building permit issued for the stair tower. The design review board has reviewed and approved the building addition. We received this application for a license agreement and the associated design drawings. They were sent out to local public and franchise utilities who have facilities in this 10-foot alley. <coughs> None of them objected to the installation. Most of them noted that they did have buried utility lines in the alley and indicated they wanted them located and marked in advance of the installation. A couple of things that we would note is this alleyway is not open to through vehicle traffic. So this reduces the concern about having an encroachment interfering with vehicle travel. It would extend out about three feet into the alley and um, there's no concrete or metal steps that are being proposed, just the handrail itself. Um, the architect did carefully review the possibility of recessing the doorway and determined that it was not feasible. So these, this drawing depicts the stair tower and the outward swinging door here. And so you have both an elevator and a set of stairs in the same tower. This is the alley and that's, that's the door swing. And then we also have a cross section of the handrail, don't we, John? Yeah. And so if you're going up and down the alley, this is the side of the building and this handrail will extend out. Um, did you get or include the photograph from the uh, Blue Sky Brewery? Yeah. Okay. So <clears throat> this is an illustration of a similar installation. This is Blue Sky Brewery. This is an outward swinging door. It swings into the alley. These are the handrails that were installed. The only distinction here is the steps. And you can see in a lot of our alleys here, there are gas meters and other types of meters that extend out into the alleyway. And so this handrail doesn't extend out much farther than those meters that are already there. And so this is we attempt to avoid this when we can. It was determined that there was no way to have a recessed alcove here, um, but this is not unprecedented in the, in the downtown area. And so there, there shouldn't be any fiscal impact on the city as a result of this. Um, Blue Beacon International will be responsible for installation and maintenance of the handrail. So we've identified uh, three options for you. One would be to approve the attached resolution authorizing to mayor to sign a license agreement with Blue Beacon International. You could postpone consideration of this request if you feel you need additional information to make a decision. Or you could decline to approve the resolution and give staff and Blue Beacon additional direction. Is, is there any traffic at all that goes through those alleys? Well, John has the bollard plan. Okay, because I see a bollard down there right. on the on the and, south side. And what, I didn't know if there was going to be one up here. What we discussed with Mr. Walker, and he may want to speak to this, but um, <laughs> we agreed as city staff that it would be beneficial to install a bollard at the right here at the yeah. entrance to the alley to alert because you do have the possibility of somebody pulling in here mm -hmm. and not realizing till they get to that bollard. So. We discussed with Mr. Walker the possibility of putting a bollard here to alert the traveling public that that is not vehicular. The, the bollards were uh, installed to replace other types of barriers and they're designed to be lowerable so the alleys can still be swept or plowed. But um, we think that there is some attention that needs to be paid a little more strategically about where those are located so that where alleys intersect streets, they better inform the public that that's not a vehicular alley. Yeah. I've always been amazed that UMB didn't lose an employee or two mm -hmm. because uh, those used to be a th a f through alley. And I mean, you're, a, you're one step and you were in the alley. So it was just, mm -hmm. so yeah, I think that'd be beneficial to have the Ballard there, so. Uh, Guy Walker with uh, Blue Beacon, we would certainly prefer that as well. We, yeah. we share your concern. <laughs> um, 
And I, I can't think of anything to add. Thank you for the prior vote. Uh, we, we look forward to, I guess, working on the building and filling it up as well. We, were, we shared your concern about it's, uh, it. Definitely the bank has shrank over the years. And so our goal, we've leased the fourth floor and the bank's leasing the first. So we have two to go. So I feel pretty good about that considering it's not done yet. So um, if I can answer any other questions, I'd be happy to. Uh, probably wouldn't be directly directed to you, but when that alley is plowed, is what plows it uh, slim enough that it doesn't take up the yeah, whole alley? They, they yeah. have a, uh, a, a small vehicle, and we have tested it on the other alleys that we have, and that what the bollards do, the bollards are, can be lowered, and so they, they, they flatten the bollards and then plow that, mm -hmm. but they're their vehicles are much smaller than the width the of the alley. And fire department, I noticed there are parking lots behind, so the fire department would not have a reason to have to. No, the fire department for a fire lane needs 20 lane. clear feet, and they would not, fit in they would not try to go down a 10-foot alley. Before you leave, don't, don't sit down quite yet. <laughs> Dean, I did, I did have uh, just one other question. And first of all, I mean, I just want to say I'm completely on board with um, um, the entrance as it's proposed. But I had a question in regard to um, several years ago, there was a request to put an alley entrance, I want to say like at 104 or 106 North Santa Fe. It was behind the um, eccentricity building where mm -hmm. Next Tech is. And I, can't, I couldn't remember what the stumbling block for that is. Did they, was that that they needed to install a it, bollard to prevent traffic? It eventually got approved okay. with the condition that we were going to install a bollard 63 feet north of iron. And the reason for that is that the Strombergs didn't want the alley completely closed because they have deliveries that pull into the very south portion of that. Okay. So the... To my knowledge, those steps haven't been installed yet. They were authorized, but the, okay. the bollard was to be placed 63 feet north of iron so that the Strombergs could pull a vehicle there, but that the bollard would protect the steps at the back of eccentricities. But okay. you did approve a license agreement for that. Okay. Eventually, it took, I think, six meetings, but we got there. So. <laughs> that. And that wasn't even us. Yeah, I don't think <laughs> that, that, was that, that was before our time. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> All right, any comments from the public on this issue? Seeing none, bring it back for action. Mr. Mayor, I'll make a motion we approve resolution 19 7767, considering approval of a license agreement with Blue Beacon International to allow an outward swing exit door and associated handrail and public alleyway on the south side of Iron, east of Santa Fe Avenue. Second. Okay, been moved and seconded to approve resolution 19-7767. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries 5 nothing. Thank you, Mr. Walker. You may move to 8.4. I said that right? Yeah. Item 8.4, resolution number 19-7758, appointing members of the Planning Commission to serve on the Board of Zoning Appeals and the Heritage Commission. Evening, Mayor and Commissioners. One last item. Um, we have membership requirements for our Board of Zoning Appeals and the Heritage Commission that require that one member of those boards be members of the a member of the Planning Commission. And the reason for that is just to um, encourage communication and cross pollinization between those boards so that um, a Planning Commission member can educate those boards about what's going on with the <coughs> Planning Commission. And historically, the Planning Commission has held its annual business meeting in September, and we have sought volunteers for membership to serve on those boards. We had an appointment. We kept it in the minutes, and we recorded those appointments, and they went on to serve. The step that we were missing for many years was that the, those appointments were not made or ratified by the mayor. So in this particular case, um, your policy for establishing boards and commission appointments provides that the members will be appointed by resolution submitted by the mayor to the full city commission. So back in September, um, the planning commission nominated John Olson, a planning commission member, to serve on the Board of Zoning Appeals, 
and Daniel Baffa as a member to serve on the Heritage Commission. I would just qualify that, that the, um, when you volunteer to do both, in some cases, like on the third week of a month, you might have a Planning Commission meeting on Tuesday and a Board of Zoning Appeals meeting on Thursday. So one of the things we do is to try to make sure that we have people that are both willing and able to attend multiple meetings in a week and uh, these volunteers indicated that they would serve if appointed. So your options this evening would be to adopt the attached resolution appointing John Olson to the BZA and Daniel Baffa to the Heritage Commission. Uh, these appointments are at the discretion of the mayor. Um, you could appoint other members to those boards and commissions instead of the two nominated by the Planning Commission or you could decline to make any appointments at this time. If that is done at today's meeting, then both of those boards will be short one member. Um, but these individuals have indicated their ability and willingness to serve on an additional board. Is, that one, is there any scenario in which no, so this person will be sitting on both boards? Planning Commission and Board of Zoning the, Appeals. Is there any situation in which there'd be a conflict of interest? A person hearing. Well, they case the twice? Uh, in in most cases, the the reason for the um, benefit is is that the Planning Commission helps develop many of the text amendments and rules and ordinances and zoning. The Board of Zoning Appeals is interpreting and applying those ordinances. The benefit of having a planning commissioner on the Board of Zoning Appeals is they can give the planning commissioner's perspective as to why something like that occurred. To my knowledge, Mr. Ryan served both on the Planning Commission and Board of Zoning Appeals, and I don't recall him having any situations with the Board of Zoning Appeals where his planning commission role kept him from acting on something. So that person has voting rights on the BZA? That is correct. So I'm assuming then the person from the Planning Commission would already have predetermined how they feel on an issue if it came in front of the Board well, of Zoning Appeals? Well, I will give you a concrete example. We have limitations in the City of Salina on how large a residential garage can be. Those rules were developed with the assistance of the Planning Commission and ratified by the City Commission. We have cases that go to the Board of Zoning Appeals where individuals seek a variance to have a garage that's larger than the maximum allowed in the ordinance, and that's what the Board of Zoning <coughs> Appeals is. Just because a Planning Commission member was involved in helping to form those rules doesn't mean that they aren't qualified to determine when a variance might be justified. That this, in one case, they're acting legislatively. In the case of a variance, they're acting in a quasi-judicial manner. So there's there's not there's knowledge there, but that's it's not a disqualifying knowledge. It's just the planning commissioner knows what deliberations and discussions there were in establishing what that size limit is. Well, many times mm -hmm. when an applicant is seeking the BZA for um, that action, it n hasn't always gone in front of the Planning Commission. So it's not like a quid pro quo there. A lot of times a variance, somebody assumed they could do something, <laughs> and now they're seeking a way to do it legally. I get what you're saying. Yeah. Mayor and Commissioners, I was going to mention, Dean mentioned one of the points I was going to mention, and that is, and I'm looking to Dean to be, or Lauren to correct me if I'm incorrect, that any time a member of the Board of Zoning Appeals would be considering a matter, it would only have been a scenario where the Planning Commission, when acting upon it, would have been acting legislatively, as Dean pointed out. Am I correct as well? There would never be <coughs> a case where a Board of Zoning Appeals member would be acting in a quasi-judicial manner, as they traditionally do, on a matter that the Planning Commission had acted in a quasi-judicial manner. Those two paths never cross, am I correct? The, 
if I personally make a bad decision or someone thinks it's a bad decision, they can appeal that to the Board of Zoning Appeals. If the Planning Commission, someone thinks they make a bad decision, they appeal that to you, but they can't appeal it to the Board of Zoning Appeals. So there's never a case where the Board of Zoning Appeals is considering a, an appeal of a Planning Commission action. <laughs> That explanation worked. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, we this, fine. Okay. And for the just, record, this is actually our second year that you've court. approved these appointees. Yeah. So it's, we discovered this last year, so we are just, year two. Sometimes you just got to hear it two or three times. All right. That was, I, I'm, I'm good. Uh, is there a motion on this? Mayor Davis, I move that we approve resolution number 19-7758, appointing members of the Planning Commission to serve on the Board of Zoning Appeals and the Heritage Commission. Second. Okay, hey, moved and seconded to approve resolution 19-7758. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries 5 nothing. Okay, we have a large other business, but is there any other business? Did, you had mentioned, uh, Mayor Davis, bringing up the uh, memorandum about the agricultural assessment of vacant properties um, to see if we could schedule, a, a dis I don't know what you had in mind, but like a discussion item sometime in the future to, for, to continue the discussion? Yes. Okay. Um, so I guess I am making that in the form of a motion to see if there's even any other interest in pursuing the agricultural assessment of vacant properties, um, um, valuing them at, at vacant lots. And that was really long and not well said. I'll second it anyway for purposes of discussion. No discussion. <laughs> and I, I think it's 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 good to vet the issue. I mean, if we can legally, easily, morally be entitled to funds that may be vacant for a long time, that we might have some upkeep on the streets for, wouldn't be worth. I mean, it would, would be worthwhile to see if we can get some. It, it's not going to be a huge windfall, but it, it does make a statement well and my purpose in in making the motion is if there's not support then we know staff can you know put it in their rearview mirror and they can keep going but I just I don't want to keep coming referencing it if you know if it's an if it's a non-starter well, so that's on the other hand staff may do the research and we may find out clearly and convincingly that that's not a good approach to take or would not be a defensible approach but at least we would have you know we've spent time and money vetting other issues, I won't say of less importance, but it, I guess a couple things. One, we would, I again, I've got to feel comfortable. You know, we need to discuss it to see if I really feel comfortable on which way we can go to if we are trying to circumvent the the county appraiser and the state statute. And the other is that you know my discussion points are going to be: are we are we changing the the rules during the middle of the game? Also, so we'll uh, we can discuss it. I guess I don't know how much work we want staff to go into. Before we give, I don't know if we want to give them direction at a study session, or if they come to us with. Uh, and I don't know with, how much more they can do initially than what they've yeah. already done. But yeah. it, it if, if there's direction to prepare for that discussion, I think there have been some additional talking points that we could flesh out between now and and then, and then try to facilitate your discussion about how you, if you'd like to proceed further. At least fill, facilitate discussion to see if we have a right a uh, appetite to move on it in any way direction I guess in my opinion this uh, commission short-lived and it's a matter for the, uh, the new membership after the first of the year well, and we may just get the uh, we may get the process started I mean I would not think that there won't be people who will bring the same issue up again I mean and it is you know we don't have to finish everything we start but if we at least get the discussion started or, or planned. I mean, we may find out in the first meeting, oh, yeah, it wasn't as great an idea as we thought, but at least it would have been And we, uh, better. Have, we have study sessions through the end of the year already we planned. We do. I haven't looked at the schedule, but we'll wedge it in somewhere. <coughs> we'll do that pre-New Year's Eve, New Year's Eve one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, motion on the floor to engage in discussion about uh, possible adjustments to the 
special assessment policy, and it, it's not a great rewording of what you said. But uh, yeah, to look at doing, um, to evaluate the um, efficacy and legality of um, doing, um, converting ag valuations to vacant lot uh, valuations Thank through, you. through development agreements. Or All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Only one I'm not sure I heard was Nay. you. Nay. Nay. Okay, so the motion fails two to three. All right. We may now move on to. Okay, I just got one favor. Other bit. Yeah. I just want. I need a clarification. I think I talked to. I talked to Mr. Scrag here several weeks ago. Do we have a number of how many? I don't know if you want to call them bollards or whatever they are downtown that we've <laughs> put in. That how many have been hit? Because yeah. I just keep getting these, I get these <laughs> yeah. phone calls and right. from people Same. saying, you know, I just watched a trailer run right over top of one of them. And I mean, if we're having problems with those things being hit out there, I don't want to just keep on putting them back up one after another and having to buy more of them. It, it, no doubt it is occurring. We, staff's been looking at, trying to look at how, how it is that it's occurring. And we have a couple theories. Number one, um, the the intersections aren't entirely open, so it did, with a lane blocked, it kind of forces some drivers to take a tight corner. There's the, a gradual incline rather than a curb there that you're jumping before you run into the bollard. We're having conversations on two fronts. One is um, just kind of the construction of them and, and some of the issues that we want to take up with a vendor. And then if we keep them, we were coming up with a plan and a cost estimate to move them back approximately two feet. Yep. Yeah. And we already have on a couple of the intersections. Is so it yeah. help? Is it helping? Yeah, the ones that have moved back haven't been hit, but okay. we haven't had any hit recently, really, since we've opened up the the street. I'm not aware of one that's been hit recently, but we're up yeah. to ten that have been hit. So. I was going to say, I'm downtown every day, and it seems like there's more down than there are up. So, I mean. I, and <laughs> not that it mitigates the problem by any means, yeah. but the contractor's yet to turn the project over to us, yeah. and so they're kind of responsible at the moment. Yeah, and I don't but know if who don't that solve falls the problem, on, if that falls on the, the architect, you know, who designed it or what. Yeah. But it's <laughs> <laughs> We're kind of at a loss as yeah. to... I, I, this is just my personal assumption, but I guess in, in a large 18-wheeler, you may not even see that side of your vehicle that low and may not feel it when you hit it. And but these are the black ones? Yeah. Yes. Oh, Which yeah. 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 don't show up and too well at night. Well, they're lit. They're, they're lit. lit yeah. But I'm not sure yeah, it's okay. a, a nighttime exclusive yeah. problem at the moment. Uh, and then I've got one other item that, that a number of you have asked me about and, and uh, thought it might be worth sharing with you all. Holly McCain from the city manager's office reached out to you about your availability for a, a um, attorney general presentation on open meetings and and open records. And some of you asked whether that was proactive or whether that was initiated by the attorney general, which is an understandable question. I didn't anticipate that question coming up. But as part of our board and commission training, we were identifying what our model was going to be going forward. and. There was definitely interest expressed by the, the city commission that you wanted um, <coughs> commission members to have been trained before they could participate in a meeting. And in all honesty, our past track record when we have invitations is very minimal attendance. So we were trying to gear up for uh, videotaping the presentation and, and the information and then at a minimum having them affirm that they've watched it on their own time as a possible compromise to mandatory attendance. And as we brainstormed all that, we identified that the Attorney General's office already does training in Topeka and they make their PowerPoint presentation available as a public resource on their website. So w our intention was to make that available, record that, and then make that a, a part of our, our ongoing training for our boards and commissions. So it was proactive on our part. It wasn't at some request of the Attorney General's office, and they were more than happy to work with us in terms of making that presentation. And then, uh, ironically, we asked whether we could record it when a public meeting can be recorded by statute. So they confirmed <laughs> that it would be fine to record it and, and share it. Um, I don't know if, you, if, if you've heard of this, but the League of Kansas Municipalities is um, per, uh, participating in um, a program called the Appointments Project, um, which is designed not only to uh, recruit women, 
under other underrepresented um, populations in terms of public service, public boards. And I met with um, a representative from the Women's Foundation a few weeks ago, and he actually had some really good um, websites. I, I want to say the city of Wichita was one of the links he sent me that had um, that had tra online like Coma and Cora right. training and uh, board orientation. And you know, if we don't have to reinvent the wheel, you know, sure. why why would we? But um, I'll make sure that I get. Um, his contact and, and get those links to you. To Please just, do. I, yeah. I wasn't aware of the project. I, we have yeah. looked at uh, Wichita in particular's approach to training, and it it appears to be staff training with people in attendance in the room recorded and then made available uh, online. But we're looking at taking the same approach. Thank you, Mayor. If I may, the only thing I might add, I um, I understand that uh, Assistant Attorney General Philip Michael would be the presenter. And I have heard that presentation at a uh, city attorneys association meeting. He's fairly recent in that role. The, the attorney general's office has uh, an assigned assistant that we consult with occasionally who, who just, they can't give you the yes or no, but they can make sure you're looking in all the right places. Uh, and I thought it was very helpful. and. Frankly, I thought they might be a little reluctant. They, I've seen the, or I've been present for what they do in Topeka, which I assume will be similar to the program out here. And it, it's just difficult to do any better than to have <laughs> the an assistant attorney general, uh, you know, directly advising uh, on how they view the interpretation of the law. So if it did seem, I don't mean to try to influence your thinking unnecessarily, but to have that opportunity uh, for them to come out and make it locally available, I think, would be a very helpful As part of our exercise. brainstorming, we, to, we thought it might be, become a regional offering that we could host and, and extend it to other entities uh, beyond our own. Will we be inviting all our boards and commissions? Yes. No, not necessarily mandatory, but inviting them. And then, as I said, we'll be recording it and making that <laughs> link available so that if they're not able to attend, um, they can still get the benefit of it. I'd like to never refuse an offer from a judge or an attorney general. Uh, and get them out of Topeka and, and get some real world questions asked. I, I, this would be after the second Monday in January or before? Uh, we're targeting, targeting yet this year to try to That's wrap up I board and commission really, training okay. and get that all integrated. Excellent. Go ahead. I was just, I was going to go to the next thing. With the information we have on the plastic bag, this is a very good resource. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah, a, right. a good portion of that was, re <laughs> no pun intended, was recycled from on the prior, prior presentation, um, but then there's new information as we discussed as well. Do we have any time on a study session plan now? To, re to just talk uh, about well, it's really kind of your preference as a governing body whether you want to make that a study session discussion or whether you want to make that a other business item to confirm you have consensus on how to proceed first uh, but I can check the the uh, study session or the agenda planner oh I'm sorry I thought the question was is there an available date no there is can, not can one we scheduled be at the precise moment. enough in our comments during okay. a regular, you can during a regular meeting, because this conversation has the potential to drift, <laughs> and, and uh, so it should be far enough out for folks to get their thoughts together. Yeah, I mean, so we're talking about setting a date um, to have it as a discussion item. Mm -hmm. I gotcha. <coughs> December, early yep. December. That will work early December work for everyone here. Mm -hmm. yeah. Executive session. <laughs> Can I, do we have an executive session? We, 
if it's approved, yes, so we do. I, I, <laughs> do we need I need some motion? clarification. Do we have Oh, I'm sorry. I consensus? thought you were looking uh, for a date. Um, um, uh, December, uh, December 9th and 23rd, if you want to meet on the 23rd. We've been having some uh, staff conversation about whether uh, that's good. <laughs> that we just wanted, actually we wanted on the, We just wanted it as the discussion item. So December 9th, I think, would be. Yeah, well, yeah if you, if, if we've yet to decide whether you're meeting on the 23rd, but the only other available date is the 9th. Um, now, is there a reason we would not be meeting on the 23rd? Unless yes, have, for, for, for you're going out of town? Uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Santa Claus. Now, if, if, it was, if it was the 24th, I, I, I'm not a total Scrooge. But, but, uh, I apologize. I, I'm, I'm confused. Is your preference? <laughs> that we, now, question number one is do we want to discuss it further? Question number two is in what format? Study session or regular agenda item? I'm getting the impression that folks are ready for a regular discussion item. Or I was going to go study <coughs> session, but I'll, for, for I'll, the, I'll be ready either for the, one. For we the just clarity go down the consensus road. among you as a governing body, my suggestion would be that you make a motion and second and vote to take whatever action it is that you want to take. Okay. I make a motion that we put the as a discussion item on December the 9th for the plastic bag discussion. I'm not going to use the word ban. <laughs> <laughs> I'll second. I, I'm not going to be able to make eye contact with, with, with anybody, but I just feel like we've got so much on our plates right now. I want to be supportive of this, but uh, just not... Uh, this is this would not be to enact a ban. This would be I, to discuss. I know, I know yeah. but I, I still want to be appreciative of the fact that even if it's just a discussion item for us, I mean, you saw the the packet that of, of information and material, and granted, a lot of it was recycled, but um, <coughs> I'm just I don't know. I, I'm just well, not sure. I don't know if there has been a slow season for commission work <laughs> in the last. 30 years. Uh, so if, if you're waiting for that perfect time, it, it's, not gonna, yeah. it's not gonna show up anytime soon. Right. And unfortunately, staff has demonstrated its ability to get the work out, which was shame on them, because now we expect it, so <laughs> we know they can do it. Point taken, we'll, we'll try to be better at not getting <laughs> right. things done. <laughs> right, motion on the floor. Those, uh, to put this on regular, dis for regular as an agenda item for discussion at our regular meeting on December 9th, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Nay. Okay, so passes four to one. Be on our agenda item December 9th. I hope the agenda is shorter than this evening. <laughs> <laughs> I would say it's got to be, but you know, I've learned better. Uh, <laughs> all right. Now, I think we're ready. Now, okay, how long? 30, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, okay, I'll talk break. fast because then we can, can we take get a it five out. Minute eight? Break too? And if it, would, it might be helpful for me to give a little bit of an update just uh, before you go into, uh, before you make the motion. Um, as I'm sure you recall, September 30th is when you last discussed the Expo Center uh, lease agreement and we met in executive session. You provided direction. I provided written correspondence to Saline County Commissioners the following morning um, and we now have a response from them. Um, it, we at the time proposed a 30 year, 30 year term to the lease. We asked for more detail in terms of the work to be done and the schedule of the work to be done. They have responded with a schedule and a proposed 40 year term for the lease and so it's necessary for us to further discuss um, their basically counter response and how we wish to proceed. Will we be taking any action? Uh, you could give staff additional direction on another round of correspondence, so it's a possibility. I move that the City Commission recess into executive session for 30 minutes to discuss the subject of negotiations with Saline County relating to the Expo Center lease agreement with legal counsel based upon the need for consultation with an attorney for the public body which would be deemed privileged in the attorney-client relationship pursuant to KSA 45-7319B2 and for the reason that the public discussion of the matter would adversely affect the interests of the city. 
The open meeting will resume in this room at 8.45 p.m., allowing for a five-minute break Second. to proceed. It's been moved and seconded to recess into executive session for the reasons stated. All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are in executive session after five minutes. <clears throat> All right, call the meeting back into regular session. We have been having discussion about the proposal and communication uh, sent to us from the Saline County Board of Commissioners, and uh, we do plan to take some action. Mm -hmm. Mayor Davis, after reviewing the recent proposal from the Saline County Board of Commissioners, we instruct staff to set up a joint meeting with the Sling County Board of Commissioners to discuss the proposed Expo Center lease. Second. I guess there's one clarification. I think we'd be requesting that without their, the county's consent. We don't necessarily well, have say it's unilateral authority to yeah. set that up. <laughs> <laughs> request. Okay, thank you. Okay, been moved and seconded to request a joint meeting with the Sling County Board of Commissioners to discuss the Expo Center lease. All in favor? Say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The motion carries five nothing. Make a motion we adjourn. Second. Second. One discussion. The commissioners here will be at the where will we be tomorrow? Employee appreciation is breakfast. In, is it in and Tony's Port? Pizza Event Center? So yep. it's in the big building. Yes. Right. Tony's Pizza Event Center tomorrow morning for the at, what time? At six fifteen? By six o'clock. Oh, okay. <laughs> six o'clock or six fifteen? Uh, six fifteen. Six fifteen. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Uh, uh, Serving begins at 6.30. I think we are all asked to be there at 6.15. Right. To celebrate our very dutiful and conscientious Celine, I'm sorry, City of Salina employees. And we do not meet next Monday because it's Veterans Day. Correct. So we will be back here for a regular meeting on November 18th. Correct. All right. We are adjourned. Okay.